All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Radley Horton. I'd like to welcome everyone to this session on exposure modeling. Uh, we have a little under 90 minutes together. Four presentations, which will be 15 minutes each, should give us uh, quite a bit of time um, for discussion after. If presenters finish in less than 15 minutes, we can take a couple presentation-specific uh, questions, either clarification or, or more substantive. Um, but if presenters use the full 15 minutes, um, there won't be any questions until the very end, um, at which point, as I say, we'll probably have 25 minutes or so for, for broader um, discussion. So a couple uh, details, if I could ask people to uh, mute their cell phones. It's actually especially important for presenters to put their cell phones in airplane mode, I guess, to avoid any uh, feedback issues. But if everybody could mute their phones, we'd, we'd appreciate that. And everyone should have a microphone. So when we get to Q&A, you know, please do um, use that. So without further ado, I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, uh, Timotope, uh, Timothy Timotope from talking about an assessment of Guyana's coastline, morphodynamics in the face of sea level rise. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here, and I want to thank the organizer for giving me that privilege. Um, the presentation I have this afternoon is just um, to give you a kind of an overview of our coastline and how it has responded to sea level rise. Um, so, Though this work involves a lot of things, but I'm just giving us a summary of the evolution of that particular uh, coastline. My name is Timitope D. Timothy, and the surname is Oyedoto. So if you cannot pronounce my name, maybe you see me and you cannot say Timitope or go there about. Uh, yeah, you say Timothy. I think that one is simple. Now, I'm, I'll be talking in the next five, I mean, in the next 10 to 12, 30 minutes at most about the assessment of our coastline, the morphodynamics of it, especially concentrating on the shoreline movement in the face of sea level rise. Now, if you, if you want to know about where Guyana is, uh, for the benefit of many people that don't know, right, that's why I'm just presenting this one. So, we, the country is in South, is in South America. You know, we are in North America here, in the South America, so that's where the location of the country is. Okay. Here, that's the location of the country, and our coastline is along this part. The Guyana coastline is very narrow, in the, uh, uh, it, and it's not a wide one. However, it's very, very important to us. So, and you're going to know the reason why it is very important. Number one, the country, the 90% of the population of the country, they are concentrated along that coastal strip. So that is why that coastline is very, very important to us because it, is, it has economic and administrative significance because the, that's the center of our government, especially in Georgetown. So, uh, however, this particular coastline is facing a lot of challenges. Though it may, be, it may be very important to us, but we know that the width is very limited and the entire coastline have two very important and unique problems. Number one, the whole coastline is below the sea level, especially at the mean high tide. That's the first issue that we are being confronted with. The second one is the presence of uh, sediment load, especially the mud bank, which are, which are migrating almost annually. So, although it's a coastline that is about 430 kilometers long, um, these issues is, is affecting almost every section of this particular coastline. Now, this, the, the slide I have here is to give us a snapshot of the shoreline change metrics that um, colleagues and I calculated uh, when we were trying to look at the, the last 14, 49 years of the shoreline movement in this particular, of this particular coastline. The key thing I would like to call our attention to is the, the Guyana has about 10 administrative regions. But six of these administrative regions they are ad along the particular coastline. So from we have from region 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So that's the bulk of our administrative regions along the coastline. So if you see the dynamics of it, we can see that this particular section, this particular section of the coastline may appear not to be fully eroded, whereas these other sections here may appear to be um, highly dynamic or have eroded in the last 49 years. 
the, there are so many factors we, we could say contributed to that. Apart from the coastline responding to the sea level rise, there's still also the problems of we have a lot of big rivers that are uh, carried uh, sediment loads and they deposit them along the particular coastline. So wherever the section where wherever most of our major rivers intersect the uh, the coastal areas, there used to be a kind of dynamics in the shoreline movement in that particular area. So that is why you see that so, so the 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 river mouth of this coastline ex exhibits a lot of uh, shoreline change envelope in that particular area. Now, section by section, if you look at it, there are some sections, especially region by region. From region one, for example, there are some sections of the region that um, we see some traces of depositions, that is, um, seaward shoreline movement. And there was in some other sections, especially in region two, we could see that there is a high level of erosion in that particular area. Now, in Region 3, the history for the last 49 years is predominantly of erosion. Whereas, so similarly in Region 4, what, in Region 5 and 6, there's this um, in, um, intersection of both deposition and erosion in Region 5 and Region 6. So, but in a nutshell, if you have to look at the way the shoreline has responded in the last 49, 50 years, we see in the in region one, which is Barima Wahine, but there's about a, a kind of um, annual change rate in the positive at the rate of 2.1 me, uh, meters per year of shoreline movement. Whereas in Pomeron Supernam in region two, there's a negative um, the, the erosion of shoreline to the tune of 4.3 uh, meters per year. Whereas at Region 3, which is a Zikibu West Demara region, the rate of erosion is very high, at the rate of minus 182.4 uh, uh, meters per year. In Demara Maika, which is Region 4, there are 3.41 um, rate of erosion. But the key thing about this particular region especially this region 4, is because I think the rate of erosion, the, the rate of erosion in that particular place is very low or minimal because that is where the administrative, um, but the, the administrative station of the country is, the administrative capital. And that because of that, there, there are a lot of strong seawall that have been constructed in some years back. So that one has limited the movement of certain uh, shoreline positions along this particular, uh, in this particular region. In Maheka Babis and um, East Babis Koretine, that is in region 5 and 6, we could see that um, there's a positive shoreline um, movement in this particular, in this, in these two regions. This photo itself just speaks about to give you an evidence of some of the erosions that have occurred in some of these particular, um, in, in, along our coastline. Now, in figure, this one here, that is at region 1, and this one here is at region 2 and the region 5 and region 6 example of uh, the evidence uh, of the sea level rise in, uh, in, in, in our coastline. Now, this particular picture I want us to, I would like you to pay attention to it because I just want to, uh, the, what I've presented before just to give us the summary of what happened in the last 50 years. However, if you look at this, this structure here, this one, this one, there's what they call I think you maybe you know you're familiar with it. It's called Suisse. Is it Suisse? Yeah. Right. Now, when the the uh, the Dutch they occupied the country, they built a kind of um, a sea defense in the uh, in the nineteen in the eighteen nineties in the eighteen eighties. So at that particular section, in, when they built it, because of the river di different network of rivers, this was Suisse presented so that they would be able to regulate the movement of the river from the country to this place. But that was, that thing happened about less than 150 years ago. That's when they did the construction. So technically, what we're saying is, along this bend, there's a kind of temporary seawall that were created or that were built about 150 years ago. However, currently, these places that were like Sulu, they are now in the part of the ocean. So that means the shoreline, as the sea level has shifted from 
this place where it was like a boundary wall 50 years ago to this particular position now. So there are so many factors that are very um, that are responding uh, that have contributed to the changes in shoreline movement. But we can say there is a combination of natural and man-made factors which has re resulted in a lot of things. But the key negative effect of the man-made contribution is the removal of mangroves. So when the mangroves were removed to pave way for the seawall construction and uh, what have you and some other activities, the protection, the natural protection for the country was now uh, jeopardized. Now, for our regions, the sea level has been increasing, and this one has consistently um, been uh, recorded at least at the rate of 5.54 millimeter per year. That's the rate at which the sea level is increasing. Of recent studies, apart from the sea level, there's another factor that I said is affecting our coastline. That is the mud shower movement or the mud banks, the movement of the moths along the coastline. The, um, there are a lot of researchers, Anthony Hedros and Co. They are based in French Guyana. French Guyana is um, around this place. They've carried out a lot, uh, some studies of the mud movement along the coastline of the Guyana sheets. So the, from their studies, it's been discovered that the rate of movement is not only minor, but it's at Alami. For example, within Guyana, in Guyana alone, the yearly rate of movement of um, a mod is between one, one, it's, it's at the rate of one kilometer per year to two kilometer, two point something kilometer per year. If, a sh if the shoreline is moving along this particular rate, definitely it's going to have effect on the position of shorelines and which is one of the things we observed. But from their studies, they indicated that um, this point, this particular point here, that's where the um, mud source, and they indicated that the, at this particular point in, in our region one, that's the terminal where most of the, um, uh, the mud used to, used to stop. Now, from our studies, when we looked at the shoreline movement, we discovered that most of the shoreline positions along from this bed to this particular sections, they've experienced so much erosion. Whereas at the tip, where there's um, mud, where, where mud terminates, that is where we see some level of um, uh, deposition in this in the, in, in, our, in our region. So the like Anthony Hector, they said in, in their book, in their article they published in Frontiers recently, they said the most rapid rapid rates of shoreline change on that or course along our coastline. So, they said that by colonizing the mud banks, mangroves play an important role in mud bank dynamics and therefore in the geology of Guyana's coast. So, we have realized that um, the, 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 the clearing of mangroves has led to, has exposed our coastline to a lot of our sea, um, a lot of climate change related effect, especially the sea level rise. So the government of the country has started making effort to replant the mangroves along some sections of our coastline, especially where we observed that the erosion rate is very high. So I'll, I'll just flip through some images so that you can see the effect of some of these things. In 2010, that's when the, the government decided on that one. So this was at Region, region 4 in 2011, where the first uh, mangroves were being replanted, reintroduced into, into that particular sex section, uh, section of the country. Now, two years after, now four years after, so to a large extent, when we've been talking about, um, like I said, when the judge came in order to protect our coastline and in order to create um, some development for the, for the country, they cleared some of these mangroves and they, they replaced them with hard structures. However, the mud bank movement has not made this hard structure to prevent the coastline. Wherever the mangroves, we've observed that they have the uh, capacity and the ability to trap the mud and to be able to serve as seal uh, defense. So if you come to the country, especially when you get to the capital, even from the time you are landing in the country, you'll be seeing that protect the mangroves because they protect us. 
So that's letting you know that uh, some of the natural effect, I mean, efforts that we'll be exploring to see how the coastline can be protected. Is another, and this is another section of our coastline. Oh, sorry. Is it the village called Village 7? That's the map that was taken in 2013 and 2017 after the replanting was um, introduced into that particular section. So, technically, we've been trying to use a lot of measures to protect our coastline and to defend ourselves against um, the adverse effect of sea level rise because we know that uh, our existence depends on that on this particular protection so technically these are the main three forms of protection that we'll be embracing the Ge geotextile tubes and um, uh, brush bro brushwood dams and the rubber man growth which um, are being hinged at um, protecting our coastline this was this is being implemented at region two and uh, we completed it in 2018 we hope that uh, very soon it's going to help us trap some of the moth and uh, protect the coastline. And this is example of um, rubble mound growth, which um, was completed in June 2013, and we've started seeing some effect. Another natural means by which we've been trying to look at in um, protecting the coastline is the reintroduction of this type of grass called spatina grass. Because we know that this type of grass, they support moth cons consolidation, and it can trap some mangrove seeds. And serve as the natural uh, promote natural regeneration of mangroves so now this in 2014 when we are trying to introduce this particular plant uh this how it looks like and then in 2015 this is the result um okay so challenges that we've been having along the coastline is the extensive erosion still occur at some sections along this coastline and the modeling of the mud bank movement is, um, is another challenge we are facing with to help, especially help us with an early warning system. But as I will be leaving this particular podium now, I want to just show you this um, image. This section of our coastline in Region 3, there's no introduction of mangrove replanting because we observe there is a kind of natural um, growth of mangroves. But please take note of this crematorium, right? This from Google Health. Because natural regeneration of forest coming up in that 2011, um, 20, 2014. But no, this was this picture was from January 2014. The mangroves extended about 200 meters and served as primary sea defense. But in October 2014, loss of mangroves. And then in 2016, what happened at that place? It is not because there's human being that cleared it, but because of the um, mud bank movement that led to the destruction of the mangroves. So, and that's the crematorium here, and we can see some of the traces. I mean, if you see this section here, some of the erosions taking place. That, that's the crematorium I was calling our attention to. So, in concluding remarks, uh, along our coastline, both accretion of the position and erosions are observed, and there is a lot of variable shoreline movements over the last 50 years, which I just gave us an example of. However, I still want to um, emphasize that it is possible to still restore mangroves along our coastline, despite the fact that they were cleared some years back. However, the challenging issue we're still facing with is to be able to predict how our coastline responds to sea level rise and how the mud bank movement are causing a kind of a rapid uh, changes along this coast, our, our coastline, which is also um, likely to affect our coastal demographic growth. The pressing focus, which we, my colleagues and I, one of my friends, uh, our colleagues and I, will be talking about, is how to develop a monitoring system that will allow us not to only monitor the changes in the mangrove forest and the shoreline changes, but to be able to incorporate mapping and modeling of this mud bank uh, movement. Um, thank you. Thank you, Timothy. Uh, I apologize for not stating your last last name before, Mr. Oyedotun. Oyedotun. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Peter Ruggiero, Oregon State University, talking to us about envisioning coastal futures, exploring alternative scenarios for the U.S. Pacific Northwest coastline. All right, so we're going to be uh, moving from South America to the. Uh, 
upper left-hand corner of the United States, uh, at least the lower 48. So thanks for the opportunity today to talk to you about a couple of projects that I've been involved with, uh, with a variety of, uh, of colleagues that are listed. Uh, these colleagues come from a wide range of disciplines, including ecology, economics, social scientists, uh, et cetera, engineers, um, and, a, and a wide variety of students as well from those different disciplines. Uh, this work's been funded by NOAA and uh, Oregon Sea Grant. And basically what we're trying to do is uh, explore a variety of alternative futures for the coast of uh, the U.S. Pacific Northwest. And so I think we've, we've all been talking about the various climate controls on changing coastal community resilience so far at this meeting. Most of the focus has been on sea level rise, obviously informed with local uh, variability, including vertical land motion. On the U.S. West Coast, we also have to deal with uh, ENSO variability. It's a major driver in terms of our coastal hazards, in terms of flooding and erosion. So what's the variability there? What might changes be in store for us? As well as uh, potential changes in storminess patterns and what that looks like in terms of nearshore processes. Obviously, there's also a whole suite of socioeconomic controls on changing coastal community resilience as well to the hazards of flooding and erosion. So clearly population growth, de development patterns, but then also uh, what kind of things we might do about it. So adaptation planning. So this is the frame that we're taking with these projects is we're exploring a wide range of potential climate futures as well as a range of potential policy scenarios uh, by working with uh, stakeholders, as I'll uh, explain, and really attempting to envision a range of alternative futures, including both these uh, climate drivers as well as socioeconomic drivers. So the projects that we've uh, worked on and completed uh, thus far have been in two counties. We've taken a county scale. These are relatively rural communities, uh, less than 100,000 each in each of these uh, counties. We've worked in Tillamook County, Oregon and Grays Harbor County, Washington. We're talking about 100 kilometers of outer coast shoreline and both are backed by uh, relatively significant estuaries. In both of these projects, we've taken an approach where our objectives are to develop and work with a, a knowledge to action network where we're actually co-producing over the course of a couple of years a, a range of different adaptation scenarios that we'll explore in, some, in a modeling framework. And then as we get into the details, uh, working with this, these groups of stakeholders, collaborative, collaboratively developing a suite of tools and, uh, and information in which we can actually envision a range of uh, possible future scenarios and assess impacts associated with a range of adaptation strategies. So that's what we're aiming to do with these projects. So the, uh, the tool that we're using uh, kind of at the center of this is an agent-based model that's uh, been called Envision. It was developed by John Bolte and his colleagues at Oregon State University over the course of a couple of decades, working in very different kinds of fields and uh, river uh, situations, working on forest fires, agriculture uh, problems. This is the first projects where this model uh, has been applied uh, to coastal issues. So this model, like many of these kinds of tools, is very spatially explicit, has a wide range of data sources, uh, landscape data that's incorporated it. Um, so you can imagine we have topographic DEMs. We have a lot of information about the built environment in terms of where existing infrastructure is, uh, road, roads, et cetera, highways, um, businesses, homes, those kinds of things. Um, and then basically the model is allowed to evolve through time uh, via a variety of landscape change models some of which had already been developed as the model uh, grew over the course of a couple of decades. So things like how to incorporate population growth, how to develop that new land with population growth. So actually allocating uh, new infrastructure on the landscape through time with different uh, kind of population and, uh, and zoning kind of uh, frameworks. Um, and then a variety of uh, kind of hazards models that we developed specifically for the coastal hazards application. And, and particularly we focused on water level uh, drivers in terms of uh, forcing hazards of erosion and flooding, and then a variety of coastal change models as well. And so that's kind of the input to the model. There's a variety of scenarios that are explored, as I mentioned before, both from the policy perspective as well as climate impact uh, uh, climate impact scenarios. And then finally, we use the tool to assess a variety of stakeholder driven uh, or developed resilience metrics. Uh, you can see on the right hand side of this of this panel and a lot of the kind of the obvious ones that many other uh, folks have been talking about at this meeting uh, thus far. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a, a detail of what the, the model can do. Um, so this is kind of a, a kind of a 
definition sketch of the approach. Um, I mentioned it can handle population growth. So it, these are relatively rural communities that are having ex at the present relatively low population change uh, trends. But you can see a 2010 map of population for Tillamook County, Oregon, then a 2100. And again, the model not only places new people on the landscape, but it actually develops that infrastructure to, to support those folks as well, can even uh, incorporate um, additional critical infrastructure, et cetera. Okay. So in terms of uh, climate impact scenarios, uh, we've taken an approach where we really want to not just look at a couple of individual sea level rise scenarios, but also really exploring in as much of a probabilistic space as we can the full range of drivers for folks from oceanographic processes, hydrologic processes, uh, you know, weather variability, um, and, and sample these spaces in a Monte Carlo sense. So we really try to assess the full range of potential drivers. The, the existing observational uh, record uh, in our part of the world is only about 40 years old, and so we haven't captured every combination of uh, ENSO events with uh, high tide events with a, a 10 meter significant wave height event. And so we want to sample from those PDFs to get a very wide range of potential extreme events on the landscape. Uh, we also have some base climate change scenarios that we're working with. Um, so again, like many other uh, projects that we've talked about in this meeting, so sea level rise uh, scenarios are sort of the base case for these climate change scenarios. But we're also looking at potential wave climate variability um, and what that might look like in terms of a total water level at the coastline as well as ENSO variability, as I mentioned earlier. And so that bottom uh, right-hand panel basically is kind of this total water level approach that we're taking in, in a probabilistic sense. Okay. In terms of the uh, policy scenarios that we've uh, developed, this has been uh, really, the, the effort has been made in terms of trying to do this in a co-development uh, framework. So working over the course of several workshops over several years at both of these different uh, counties with a range of stakeholders from individual uh, homeowners uh, that might be interested in the problem to uh, county decision makers, uh, be it the, uh, uh, the county commissioners, uh, mayors of individual uh, municipalities, outreach, outreach folks, a wide range of folks that have been uh, focused on kind of thinking about what they value about the coast now, what kind of problems they're experiencing today, and then how those values might uh, you know, explore what they want the coast to look like into the future at a couple of decades scale, at the end of the century scale, what kinds of uh, uh, problems would they like to see alleviated, uh, how might they go about doing that. And so this is kind of the more fun part of the project, but also a very difficult part of the project in terms of coming up with a actual actionable um, adaptation options that can be actually coded into this uh, Envision modeling framework, okay? So we develop a range of policy adaptations that then get packaged into a couple of, uh, of different policy scenarios that eventually get crossed with those uh, climate scenarios. So we clearly compare things to a status quo, so that's a continuation of present day policies. So in Oregon, we actually have a policy where some properties are eligible for hard engineering solutions while others are not, kind of based upon when that property was developed. And so we explore what that might look like uh, going forward in time. And we compared that to other scenarios, such as a hold the line, where we really try hard to uh, protect infrastructure. But people in the hold the line scenario, in our community discussions, they wanted to make sure they still had access to beaches. So in, in Oregon, the, all the beaches are publicly accessible, and that was a very uh, significant uh, part of what folks wanted for the future of, of the community. So hold the line not only protects infrastructure, but also tries to maintain a wide beach, a very difficult thing to do. Much to the chagrin of the, uh, of the Oregon policy folks that were working with us, we also developed laissez-faire scenarios where we actually relaxed existing policies, basically letting folks do what they will and explored what that might look like into the future. This is a, a managed retreat uh, meeting, so we had a realign scenario. That, that language came from the stakeholders, where basically the idea is to change hu human activities to suit the changing environment. So that's basically developing a set of triggers and thresholds for which we actually are removing infrastructure from the landscape, moving it back into the hinterland, and a variety of others, including a hybrid solution that was based upon assessments of all the uh, individual scenarios and then what uh, stakeholders like the best about individuals. So this is kind of everything uh, combined. I'm not going to go into details, but we had a whole suite of individual actual adaptation options that again pack get packaged into these uh, relatively self-consistent but yet orthogonal to each other, more or less, uh, policy scenarios. And as I said, get those, those get crossed with a range of climate scenarios in as much of a probabilistic sense as we, as we can handle. Okay.
So then again, based upon our stakeholders' discussions, we come up with a range of metrics for which to assess the model results from. And so just some simple things that we can look at in terms of the effect of these individual policies on, say, development patterns. Uh, the state of, of Oregon's uh, Department of Geology actually has an existing uh, hazard zone that is really not used for any uh, existing um, triggers in terms of development patterns. But people, the stakeholders we were working with asked the question, what if it actually was? So we asked the question, if we had limited development within that existing hazard zone, what that might look like onto the landscape. And so these are the kinds of, uh, of plots we can make. We can actually see a very wide range of different trajectories, just simply in terms of the number of buildings within the hazard zone. So a couple of uh, these trajectories in terms of status quo, hold the line, lays they fair. We continue to build um, new structures in this hazard zone through time as new population uh, moves to this uh, location, whereas a managed retreat or realignment scenario, you're moving away from that uh, as you are having repetitive losses, repetitive erosion, repetitive flooding, those kinds of things. And so you have very different trajectories in terms of the, uh, the result of, of, of looking at these, uh, these different policy options. So the way those uh, houses are actually removed from the landscape is via easements. Uh, at some of the early projects, we didn't actually um, you know, assess where that money would come from. We just simply quantified the number, the, the amount of infrastructure that, that might need to be removed and made some very basic uh, uh, assessments of how much that might actually cost. Okay. The, the current option that is mostly used in terms of adaptation to flooding and erosion hazards in Oregon and, and parts of Washington are actually hard engineering uh, structures like this riprap revetment. We know where those structures are now, which is shown in kind of the present day plot here. But we could explore with, say, a status quo scenario what that might like, look like in the future if we make some assumptions about what kind of triggers and thresholds are needed in terms of water level, how often that water level is getting close to the base of the, uh, of the infrastructure. So by 2040, that's what it looks like, 2060, 2100. We can do this for each of the policy scenarios and climate scenarios that I, I described. As I mentioned earlier, the, one of the major trade-offs that people were interested in is what's the impact of the accessibility of these beaches. Obviously, if you're armoring the shoreline without nourishing, then you're actually having coastal squeeze. You're limiting the amount of time that you can actually access that beach. So we developed quantitative metrics to look at that as well. And so here's basically the same kind of uh, scenario where we're looking at where we have limited beach access versus unlimited beach access. And we can, in this case, look at 2100, but across a range of different policy options. And you can see under the status quo and hold the, or laissez-faire options, basically this, this about 20 kilometer stretch of coast is almost virtually inaccessible, inaccessible by the end of the century because of that coastal squeeze and it's mostly armored. Whereas if we have a managed realignment uh, scenario, you actually still have access to a good chunk of that beach. So these are some of the ways we present these results to the stakeholders. We also can look at time series again in this kind of probabilistic framework um, and look directly at the policy-driven trade-offs of some of these resilience metrics. So here's the percent of armoring along this stretch of coast versus the beach accessibility through time. And you can get a sense of these, uh, the, the influence of human decision-making as well as climate variability, which is the range of the different colors on these plots. And then, again, I mentioned we look at a variety of these different metrics. So I'll just leave you with this, this final plot. We've looked at over 100 different resilience metrics. In this case, it's just simply buildings impacted by flooding. And you can see that the range of variability associated with the climate variability, again, the kind of the, the, the width of the individual colors, is actually less than the range of variability associated with the human decision making. So the difference between the realign scenario and, say, the laissez-faire or hold the line scenario is extremely different and, and actually larger than the even from a low sea level rise to a, a high sea level rise scenario. So we feel like Presenting the results in, the, in this manner and exploring the parameter space actually has given agency to decision makers that they realize that the that decisions they're making today are going to have a potentially large impact on the future and it's, it's very significant and they can actually make a difference. So I'll leave you these final thoughts and thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Okay, next up. We're going to hear uh, one of the few talks I think gets into some mortality risk um, questions. Are you, uh, okay, and uh, Philip Wharton is going to sub for Fang Lin Zhang. Philip's one of the um, co authors on this work from Stevens Institute of Technology. How do vertical barriers influence mortality risk in low lying neighborhoods under sea level rise? Thanks, Radley. This is unfortunately Fang Lin couldn't make it. She's, she's out sick, so I'm going to be presenting for her. This is uh, work from uh, today's presentation and part of tomorrow's presentation that I'm lead author on. Are part of her dissertation work. 
which looks at uh, flood risk uh, and adaptation and looking at risk in terms of monetary risk, but also mortality, which is sort of an innovation. It's done in the by the Dutch more, but you don't see much of it in the U.S. We often just have a, very, a more simplistic qualitative approach. So the title is How do Vertical Barriers Influence Mortality Risk in Low-Lying Neighborhoods Under Sea Level Rise? We'll contrast um, uh, berm protection, seawall protection, levee, whatever you would call it, uh, versus retreat in this presentation. So it's not in the title, but I will look at retreat as an alternative option. Um, the work's funded by the Consortium for Climate Risk in the Urban Northeast under the RISA, or it's part of the consortium under the RISA program, NOAA RISA program, and we're at Stevens Institute of Technology across the river in Hoboken. All right, so climate change and sea level rise uh, will be, obviously, we know that they'll exa exacerbate flood risk by raising the flood elevations, but this also will likely increase the frequency of overtopping of defenses, unless defenses are always maintained and, and uh, built higher as sea level rises. And, and there's good reason to question whether or not there will always be funding for that if it goes from being a regional problem in places that are subsiding, like New Jersey or, or Louisiana, to where it's a national problem on all coastlines including the Great Lakes, actually, now, lately. Um, so mortality as a measurement of the flood risk is often neglected in, in studies of flood risk reduction, and they often focus more on water depth, but mortality is influenced by water velocity a lot and, and also water rise rate. Uh, I think velocity was found to be really important with Katrina and New Orleans. So that got our attention because we run hydrodynamic models that can quantify all, all these different variables as a function of time and space. So this study is a conceptual um, study using sort of an idealized model, um, creating an imaginary simplified world. We're mainly, we're just looking at physics and then a simplified model of what might trigger retreat, um, but we're not getting into a lot more of the human decision making or, or uh, evacuation decisions and, and those type of issues. All right, so um, a prior paper that submitted to the journal Natural Hazards looked at Staten Island's eastern shore, um, shown here in this uh, elongated box, um, rectangle. Um, and that's an area where there is the highest mortality during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, I haven't seen it quantified, but definitely it would be, there were about 20 fatalities in that area of, of um, Staten Island. And so I think it was almost definitely the highest per capita mortality in the whole Sandy affected area. And this is an area that has a high berm along the waterfront that was raised up by everyone's favorite person, Robert Moses, back in the 1950s after some other storms. Um, and it was made more of a linear berm-like feature, whereas it had, it had been lower and had some irregularities and inlets. There were, back in the 1800s, there was actually a tidal inlet. And this whole area had a lot of wetlands and eventually got developed into neighborhoods. Um, but the lowest lying areas uh, are the areas where there were the most mortality, most deaths during Sandy. Um, so we ran a, um, first we, uh, we did a statistical model looking at different physical variables and also socioeconomic variables and how, which ones, um, proving which ones, testing the hypothesis that each one was a factor in the mortality rates. So we ran the model, we quantified the physical variables, we also got the socioeconomic variables, and in the end the only one that we couldn't prove wasn't related was water rise rate. So it's basically a water speed, um, the rise rate of the water in the neighborhood during, during Sandy. Um, so some evidence there that, uh, fairly good evidence that the water speed or rise rate was important. And then we ran a berm experiment where we ran a historical case where there was a lower berm with, with gaps in it um, versus the modern day system. And we found that that modern day system based on this statistical model we created and the hydrodynamic modeling, it created a, a much faster rise rate and a much higher uh, probability of mortality, 250% higher probability of mortality during and this is all just looking at the sandy storm, so it's not a variety of storms, and it's focused on one location. So it, you can ask whether or not it's broadly applicable, but it, but it was what we found for this particular storm. So basically the berm is undersized. That's a critical factor. The sandy storm tide was a record-setting storm tide about four feet bigger than anything that had happened in over 100 years, and this berm was overtopped by three feet. So it was cat catastrophically overcome by this, by this storm surge. So, uh, uh, Fang Lin came up with this idea to call these neighborhoods the sort of special case of a neighborhood that's got a very long coastline and a very narrow width, a uh, coastal landfill neighborhood, a clan, so she called it. And so you see this with barrier island systems in a way where there might be a high waterfront berm uh, because of beach, because of waves, and then there's a wetlands behind it typically and maybe a back bay. In this case, there's high ground behind it, but either way, if you were to protect this with, with seawalls and levees, you would have this very long um, coastline and a very narrow width. And so if it gets overtopped, it fills up very rapidly and you have very high velocity water. 
So that's our special interest in, in, uh, in this chapter and in our first chapter. So here's the methodology. Um, for, first, the model setup. It's an idealized hydrodynamic model that we run, uh, or a hydrodynamic model on an idealized landscape. Um, we have input water condition. I'll show you a, a basically a storm surge and then different sea level, level rise scenarios. The model outputs are water depth, rise rate, and velocity, function of lat latitude, longitude, time. Um, we have a mortality, a set of six mortality models that we found, um, created either based on New Orleans experience or the Dutch experiences during different storms. And we have an ensemble output of these different mortality uh, predictions as, in terms of a probability of mortality per person for uh, each storm. And the final result, if we integrate over probability, is the annualized mortality for each uh, sea level rise scenario and each landscape design that we create. Um, so here's the model domain. Uh, it's 100 by 100 grid cells. Uh, um, we, we use a high, and so basically there's high ground, there's a berm area, and there's a neighborhood that's low lying, and then there's the ocean on, on the bottom. Um, and so it's a pretty typical clan neighborhood shape. Um, but just sort of a small scale uh, idealized case. And we do use a, a very high uh, bottom roughness, which is a replacement for actually capturing the buildings on the grid and having the water flow down streets and around buildings. Instead, which is often the case with coastal flood modeling, if you don't resolve those buildings, as we're not in this initial uh, way of, of running this, then you just give it a high friction and the water moves more slowly and fills up the neighborhood more slowly. And it's fairly accurate, but we also hope to make a separate model grid with buildings in it and streets in it to have a more detailed version of the model. And so uh, the other model settings, the, the input of a boundary condition is, uh, is a sinusoidal water level function. It gets offset by sea level rise of these different amounts up to two meters. Um, so that's what's shown here. And here's our hazard, our flood hazard definition. We go from a monthly flood to a one-year flood and all the way up to the 10,000-year flood. So it covers a broad range of flood hazard. We only we create a simplified si situation where we only simulate these, ten, these 12 flood events for each sea level and landscape scenario. And this is fairly reflective of New York City in general so far. We haven't really completely made it idealized and unconnected to New York, but, but we're trying to, you know, we're kind of creating a toy environment, but it does have a lot of similarities to what, what existed on Staten Island. And then uh, in terms of the adaptation choices, here's the um, section, the cross-section view of the landscape. So here's the neighborhood shown here in the middle. Um, there's different berm heights. There's a no berm case of control where it's just flat. Um, then there's a berm height that's the height of the 100-year return period storm. There's a berm height with an extra three feet or 90 centimeters of, of freeboard. So we can test out how important or useful that is. Um, and when there's retreat, the monthly, we, we have a retreat scenario where when a location, and basically the population is evenly spread through this whole region of the low-lying neighborhood, but also up the slope. So we're kind of creating this little self-enclosed place where there's a high ground and, and flood zone in, in this um, landscape. Um, and the retreat scenario, once a neighborhood gets hit by monthly flooding, then, uh, then people will automatically retreat and evenly be spaced up, upland. Um, and so that, that's our retreat scenario. So we have the berm scenarios shown by the blue and black, and then the retreat scenario uh, is, is where they move, it basically moves the population within the same environment but uphill. So they're not retreating outside of the one year flood, they'll still get hit by that or the extreme event floods. And that's a very realistic retreat scenario. Um, there's some hypothesis that I think is still being evaluated, came from um, NOAA, Billy Sweet, for example, that it's t sort of a tipping point for impacts of and the acceleration of the number of floods per year, and it's basically monthly, monthly flooding. Um, that starts to lead to a uh, neighborhood being uninhabitable. All right, so here's animations. First, I'll introduce them on the left. Um, so there are three different landscapes. It's the 500-year return period flood with zero sea level rise. Uh, on the far left is a case where it's the control. The middle is a 2.8-meter high berm, so the flood is delayed, but then it overtops. And on the right, then there's a um, case of a 3.7-meter berm that never, um, never gets flooded. And so these are water level data shown here. So you see the quick overtopping here, the delayed overtopping here, um, but faster water velocities and some trapped water in the, in the end scenario in both cases because this is just somewhat higher than the berm height. Um, and then the far right shows there's no flooding with the 3.7 meter berm with the extra freeboard. So that's just some examples of the idealized model simulations. Then we've got those data. We can plug in the mortality models. 
Some of these models have just water depth as a, they're just a function of water depth only, um, shown on the left. Uh, and they're based on, typically based on one storm, or in some cases, I think this Jonquin model is based on storm, uh, storm events from different, around the world, wherever they could get data. Um, that one's based on water depth, water velocity, horizontal velocity, and vertical rise rate. Um, so there's, and these, uh, this other one has velocity and water depth in it. So we've got six different models. Um, we're open to using more. We're just trying to get a sense of the range of, of results that we would get from different models. And the da data analysis, just an important note is that we, we compute the mortality at every grid cell, but then we take um, the temporal maximum mortality during the storm, and we take the spatial mean of that uh, and present that as our result, um, assuming that people are evenly spread through the area that's, that's flooded. Um, we apply the trapezoidal rule to integrate over probability. That's a typical, this is just typical procedure if you're, um, if you're looking at a flood, flood risk and you're integrating damages over probability. Um, so that can give you an estimated annual damage and monetary or an estimated annual mortality in this case. So it's the return periods uh, or probability shown here with the trapezoidal rule and the mortality um, probability shown on, on the right side as M. So some different results. Um, on the bottom uh, axis is sea level rise scenarios. On the y-axis is the ratio of the mortality in an adaptation scenario to the mortality in control. So if it's above one, that means you made things worse. If it's below one, you made it better. Um, and then these are the six different models. The first thing you might notice is that the models are really different at present day. Some of them suggest a high, you know, not as much of a benefit and some uh, of adaptation and some suggest a, a not as much of a benefit. I think this is because um, these are the depth dependent models and they're not using velocity and they see like a shallow flood as not being very deadly. So the monetary damage here might be high, but in this case, the, some of these models suggest that there's not much danger for mortality. And so it's not much better than control where there's no protection at all. And, and the other take home is that as you increase your sea level rise, your benefit goes away. And that's no surprise there. Um, and with the additional freeboard, you, you, uh, it extends your benefit to having a higher amount of sea level rise. So that's not a surprise either. The nice um, result is that when we contrast, uh, look at the next slide, when we contrast retreat, you have a benefit going forward forever. And that, you might think that's obvious, but it's nice that we can just show it in a quantitative way. Um, as you retreat people more and more as the sea level rises and the monthly flooding is hitting them, they're retreating um, increasingly just retreating and getting out of that monthly flood zone and into higher ground. Um, so you do get, we again have this big difference in the models, and I'm definitely going to talk to Feng Lin and try to really better understand that, but I think it's just that these depth dependent models don't treat a three foot, a, you know, one meter deep flood as being deadly. Um, and some of these ones that include velocity do, do see it as being more dangerous. Okay, so some conclusions, uh, and I still have another slide of conclusions and a little more results to get to. For both the low berm and the high berm, with the increase of sea level rise, the ratio of berm mortality to control mortality decreases at first as you have more sea level rise, but then it increases and, and the benefit goes away as you have more sea level rise. Um, for retreat, all model types suggest that retreat from monthly nuisance flooding reduces mortality significantly now and into the future uh, with any amount of sea level rise. Um, and that, but the model differences are, are substantial, as I mentioned. Okay, and now looking at absolute probability of mortality instead of, uh, per person, instead of looking uh, at the ratio of mortality with the adaptation to the control, you see things just in a different detail. Here, I'm averaging all six models. So I'm not showing the six different models. I'm just averaging all six models for control, the berm, the berm with freeboard, and retreat. And you see, again, how the retreat approach um, helps further into the future with more sea level rise. Up to a certain point, the higher berm is actually more protective than the retreat scenario. So final conclusions, uh, an elevated berm fronting a coastal landfill neighborhood provides flood mortality risk reduction for present day flood hazards. If you build it to a higher uh, level with freeboard, it can provide protection to more sea level rise. Um, berm protection therefore needs timely upgrading. Uh, and so if, if, if that can happen, then berm protection can be successful in the longer term. Um, and the last conclusion is that retreat from monthly tidal flooding provides better long-term mortality risk reduction than the berm protection, even the berm protection that has freeboard added to it. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Philip, and we appreciate your, your standing in for Fanglin. All right, our last uh, talk of the session is from Eric LaRure, uh, NASA JPL, talking about whether coastal planners should care where the sea ice, uh, excuse me, where the ice is, sea level is coming from. Sorry for mangling that. No worries. <laughs> So yes, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, delighted to present these results. Um, everything I'll be talking about is about grounded ice, not even sea ice, not even ice shelves, just grounded ice. So ice sheets we call them, and they're really the, those massive areas of ice that are on land. And uh, the reason is because sea level rise. There is no cause of sea level rise when you melt sea ice or ice shelves. They're already floating. It's like ice cube in a glass of water. If you melt your ice cube, the water doesn't <laughs> overflow. Um, so I'll be presenting results from our team, uh, me, Eric Ivins, uh, geodesist at JPL, and Surendra Adikari also uh, uh, working on sea level rise. Um, this is basically the result of a science advances paper we published in 2018. And the angle here is to try and understand how you can attribute sea level rise in a specific location to components of sea level that are related to ice only. We don't do hydrology, we don't do ocean dynamics here. We're trying to figure out if you're somewhere in New York, sea level rise there, is it due to Alaska? Is it due to Greenland? Is it due to Antarctica? Or, or other glaciers out there? So it's, it's not something easy and, and we think we have a solution here. So this methodology that we use is, is we refer, it, uh, refer to it as gradient fingerprint mapping. So we're basically going to look at the sensitivity of sea level rise to the inputs uh, in the system, which are our glaciers and ice sheets. And so instead of just modeling how glaciers melting give you sea level somewhere, we're trying to backtrack going the other way. It's a reverse approach. What is uh, impacting our local sea level rise when you go the other direction, trying to figure out which mass of ice is important to you? So a little bit of the background here. Um, these are the sea level trends that we're uh, currently observing. So uh, getting towards the 3.4, 3.8 millimeter per year range, uh, quite important uh, trend here. And of course, we want to basically understand why this is happening and how to relate local sea level rise to um, the cause, which if you look at Antarctica here, as observed by GRACE, um, the GRACE satellite, for the last uh, 16, 17, 18 years now, um, you see clear trends in uh, in Antarctica on the west side. Of, can you see my cursor? Yeah. West Antarctica basically melting, but you don't see much in East Antarctica. So, is this important to you if you are in New York, if you are in uh, London? Does that make any difference? And and we want to get to the bottom of this question. If you look at glaciers, it's also a wide hodgepodge of different areas where there's quite a bit of contribution, especially in the 20th century, the bulk of some of the components in terms of sea level rise coming from the ice, again, not from the ocean thermal expansion. I'm only looking at ice inputting mass into the ocean. I'm not looking at expansion of the, the ocean thermally, which is responsible for a, a tremendous amount of sea level rise. This is not what we're looking at here. All of these spots here are basically creating. I'm sorry. So you got the Alaskan glaciers, you got uh, Himalayan glaciers, and, and a different set of glaciers everywhere. Uh, some of the Peninsula and Patagonian glaciers are not considered ice sheets. So, um, what are these glaciers going to do, combined with Greenland and Antarctica, to and, and to be responsible for sea level in your area? And which of these spots? And there is about 15 of these big, large glacier areas in the world are really concerning to you locally. So we have to go a little bit deep in terms of processes to understand what's really important uh, to answer this exact question. One, um, <coughs> when you dump ice in the, in the ocean, you have what we call the initial model is to assume that the sea level rises everywhere the same. It's called the bathtub model. Put your ice cube in your, in your glass and the water in the glass goes up everywhere the same. But that's not exactly what's going on. When the ice melts, it's so heavy that it actually modifies the gravity field locally, weakens it. And so what happens then is that sea level locally, to where the ice is melting, is receding away. So in the Canadian Arctic, for example, or in, in front of Greenland, you'll have sea level uh, 
decrease locally because the mass of ice is so massive that the sea level, the sea level basically recedes away and the sea level goes far away, as far as you can get from the ice. If there's one thing that's really easy to understand is the further you are away from the ice, the worse off you are. Always. It's the opposite of what people think. So that drop in sea level is local to the ice and uh, far away from the ocean you get about 10-20% more sea level actually due to that mass of ice melting. Now, locally you also have something called the crystal rebound and so here we're looking at elastic rebound. We're not doing viscous rebound. What happens is when sea level uh, basically decreases locally uh, and when your mass of ice is also melts, the bedrock uplifts vertically. Um, and quite a bit actually in some areas. So that also decreases sea level locally. Um, and that also siphons off some mass through the mantle into this area where the ice is going up. So it modifies the entire uplift profile of actually the entire planet when you put all the masses together. So you have to take that into account if you want to know uh, the sensitivity of your sea level to uh, these masses of ice. So, Fairland Clark in 76 devised this very simple one-dimensional problem where, hey, you have a mass of ice that um, basically uh, gets into the water, and this gives you a pretty easy um, formula up there. Sorry, my so basically it relates uh, the mass of ice being melted to the sea level locally, and it's basically a function of the distance to the mass where you are from the mass of ice. Uh, quite easy, right? Um, and that actually gives you a fairly straightforward sensitivity. You, you know exactly why you're being hit by sea level locally. You know it's that mass of ice, and you know because you're at a certain distance from it, you know exactly by how much. Now here's the problem, is that uh, when you look at this same Antarctica mass, and you look at what we call a fingerprint um, for this um, West Antarctica mass of ice melting here, you look at this simple forward model of where sea level would increase most and you see this uh, um, basically increased sea level on the, east, on the northeast coastline of the United States and uh, the Indian Ocean. That's just for West Antarctica. So you see this very, it's not just a simple distance to you, to the mass that is important. It's really where are you on the earth compared to where all those processes are hitting you and on top of that the uh, most complicated process, I'm, I'm showing this uh, spinning top. Basically, the Earth is exactly like a spinning top. And when you're modifying a spinning top, if you were able to poke a spinning top while it's running and grab a little bit of mass out of it, it would start wobbling like nuts. That's exactly what's happening when you remove masses of ice everywhere. The Earth starts wobbling, and the sea level feels that and starts doing these very funky patterns of basically um, dipoles uh, for West Antarctica, the result is North America and the Indian Ocean dipoles. That's where you get hit most. Now, what happens when you combine all of these masses of ice, all of these effects together? How do you know what's hitting you when you're locally in New York? So what we devised is a gradient fingerprint approach. You grab this really significant, very large model of, uh, of sea level. We have a finite element model with a big mesh in it. Uh, we run this um, forward model for each mass of ice. You can figure out the pattern like I showed for Antarctica. But now what you want to do is actually reverse this. The model gives you from the ice, gives you sea level everywhere. What you want to do is, I'm going to sit in New York. I don't care about anything else. And I want to know which mass of ice is hitting me. So you want to reverse the, basically, you want to do a reverse fingerprint. Um, and so, for example, here I put Reykjavik, and you're trying to figure out whether it's Greenland, Alaskan glaciers, Himalayan glaciers, the Alps in Europe uh, hitting you. And so to do this, we basically compute these reverse fingerprints, and I've shown you, uh, I've shown one here for London, and they're very interesting. You've probably have never seen this kind of reverse fingerprints where it's only working for London here, only works for one location, you have to compute a fingerprint for each location. And we're basically saying, what is the derivative of sea level in London, or the sensitivity, with respect to changes in ice thickness everywhere in the world where there is grounded ice? And you see the fingerprint reverse here. What you realize, as I said, the further we were away from the ice, the worse. So the largest sensitivity is Antarctica, biggest derivative. 
that's really what hits you the most. Now you get closer to London and things get very interesting. You start realizing that um, the entire western part, uh, sorry, eastern part of Greenland will be responsible for a small drop or no change, no matter what you do to the eastern glaciers in Greenland, in London only, of course. So if you're in London, you really don't, don't really care. I mean, it's, I don't want to say that, but you're not concerned with what happens to the eastern Greenland. You really want to know what happens to western Greenland and actually here to the Canadian Arctic, um, which will be responsible for a small rise. You're much more concerned by Himalaya, Alaska, Antarctica, and Patagonia than you're concerned by anything close to you uh, the Alps uh, are irrelevant to you. So it really gives you a different picture and it basically what it's doing is attributing the risk to you with respect to where you're living and so this completely changes according to the location around the world and what we've done is compute this fingerprint reverses, reverse fingerprints uh, at coastlines everywhere around the world. So for example here uh, you see the reverse fingerprints for every, I mean, we've mapped uh, nine cities around uh, the U.S. coastline and, uh, and the Canadian Alaska uh, coastlines. And it's very interesting when you go around and you start turning, going from Nova Scotia to Kodiak, Alaska, and you realize that, for example, if you're in New York, um, the sensitivity uh, is extremely low and actually turns, uh, it's not negative, it's nil, at the southern part of Greenland. So, um, from <coughs> sorry, I'm really having a hard time with. Is there any other? It's hard to show anything. Oh, are you trying to? Yeah. Oh, um. Okay. So, thank you. So the entire Western Greenland, I mean, south of Jakob Seven. Uh, basically is going to be responsible for no sea level rise whatsoever in New York. However, if you look at uh, uh, the northeastern ice stream and um, uh, basically Peterman Glacier, all of these, these are really the ones that are important to New York. Now, if you start rotating around, you realize that when you reach Los Angeles, Greenland is basically important to you anywhere else. Anywhere in Greenland is important to you because you're far away from Greenland. Um, it's, so that I would call that the eustatic case, the all the mass going in the, that's the bathtub case. All the mass going in the ocean is important to you. And when you keep rotating, you see the reverse happening is that uh, the eastern part, sorry, the western part of Greenland starts being com becoming a lot more, uh, a lot, lot less relevant to, uh, to the uh, western shoreline of the United States. Uh, and in Alaska, it's kind of a, almost a reverse scenario from uh, Nova Scotia. So this is kind of something that I don't think people realize how sensitive those fingerprints were to exactly where you are. And so it's not just a bathtub model. And we have to really step away from that assumption. Uh, that also allows you to do something really neat, which is to attribute sea level rise locally to quantify exactly where, what it is due to. For example, this is a study that was picked up from uh, our paper. They actually applied all our gradient fingerprints uh, to uh, several, several areas in Iceland and Northern Europe and they were able to show exactly what basins are hitting each one of these locations in Hel Helsinki, Stockholm, Oslo and Reykjavik uh, and so you see this distribution of very different uh, attributions for every one of the cities um, so one thing to notice is that we don't have reverse fingerprints for what they call non-ice processes, which are usually GIA uh, rebound of the Earth crust for these areas. And so we can't get into this black box. It would be really interesting to kind of push the attribution problematic here and, and find a solution to, push the, to open up that black box. But what we've done here is basically, before all of this was black, and now we know exactly how to attribute uh, sea level due to ice for every one of the cities to every other glacier. That also means that if you are um, assessing the risk of sea level projections locally, you can go and decompose your risk according to each glacier and what we know about these glaciers. And we just don't know the same amount on each about every glacier. We are monitoring, and NASA, we're monitoring a lot of the Himalayan glaciers. We are monitoring 
um, Antarctic and Greenland very thoroughly, but there's other areas that we're not as concerned with, and that is a problem. One minute? Okay. And so here, uh, you, you could really see risk-based models where you assess a certain uncertainty in the evolution of, for example, uh, Greenland glaciers, and you see all these studies coming out every year about different basins, and we're starting to kind of refine our assessments. And then you could put this through the gradient fingerprints to understand the overall uh, sigma deviation in your projection for this specific location where you're at. And so this is an example where we just decompose Greenland into all these basins and we looked at uh, for each one of these basins for every city we were able to decompose how much this particular basin would hit every one of the cities and you can then start really assessing your risk in terms of where am I? Is this glacier really important to me? And if it is, then I really should be concerned about studies that look at this glacier in particular. So for coastal planners, it's a really good tool to assess very quickly uh, which areas they should be concerned with and monitor these areas uh, more thoroughly. And so in conclusion, you can use this tool by basically you pick up your port city, you figure out by looking at the gradient map gradient reverse fingerprint for this city, you, s you figure out which glaciated areas are important to you, and then you pick up a certain set of scenarios for how those important glaciers are going to evolve, and you ascribe a certain uncertainty to them, and then you basically recompose all of this into your own local projection for that specific city with your own uncertainty. A gradient fingerprint is a fully linear system. You can multiply the uncertainty of the projection by that gradient fingerprint to figure out the uncertainty locally, and you can also multiply the projection by that fingerprint to obtain the, the projected value. So you can get the projected value and the uncertainty through these gradient fingerprints. They're a very useful tool for this. I think I'm going to leave it at this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eric, I apologize if, if I missed this, but the tool can also, it works in a, in a time sense as well. So you talked about how it melts in Greenland and, and the water uh, that is, has melted there goes as far away as possible. And so you can, you can also say, well, when this will get to Santiago, Chile? Yes. So, so as I said, this does not deal with thermal expansion. So no ocean dynamics whatsoever here. We're not talking about ocean dynamics. What we're talking about is instantaneous, gravitationally driven uh, sea level rise. So the same way when you drop your ice cube in the water, the water instantaneously within a second is up to the level and stabilizes to that level. It's instantaneous. I mean, it takes probably a day when a mass of ice um, melts to, refl to reflect over the entire globe. So yes, to answer your question, if you know exactly the transient evolution of the ice masses, you can use the exact same gradient fingerprints across this entire timeline to project the evolution of sea level from the ice point of view. Now, if you're looking at ocean dynamics, totally different thing. You're going to have to run an ocean model for this very different problem. Or if you're looking at viscous uplift GIA, totally different model. But for the ice box, it's actually simpler than people would think. So we were just, it, we were, of the three fingerprint terms, we were actually just seeing the gravity term there. We weren't seeing the instantaneous isostatic and the rotational, or are we seeing No, the, the, so the rotation, we were looking at rotational, elastic, and not viscous uplift. Right. Only elastic, that because it's instantaneous too. Uh, Self-attraction and loading, the gravity dropping, and uh, the effect of the ice mass loss. All of these are instantaneous. Those are known as the fingerprints. Um, yes, the fingerprints for the ice, I would say. So, so just so I'm clear, the, since it has rotation, so is it, can you linearly combine losses from different places? Yes. Yeah. So the rotational feedback itself is nonlinear. However, it is linearly dependent on the mass loss. Ah. And that's really what's magical about that solver. It's a complicated solver, 
you need to linearize a linear sol solver. It's, it's a funky thing because it's got this huge convolution in it. Mm -hmm. But once you do it once, you instantaneously solve these equations. So, so you can have a scenario where you double the amount, but yeah. you, already have, you already have your uh, coefficients. For yes, each. exactly. And so you could, like, losing all of Greenland, see what it does, lose all of the West Antarctic, see what it does, and then just combine those two in a given exactly. place. Yeah. You can absolutely do that. However, you will miss the thermal expansion, and you will miss the vertical viscous uplift. Hi, uh, Peter, a question for you. Um, how much um, buy-in or realism was there from the real estate and property owner community in your research to make some real economic decisions? Well, there were certainly uh, people in those sectors at, at the table for our meetings, um, and there was a wide variety of, uh, of, of voices that were were discussing what they valued along the coastline. Um, you know, depending upon who we present some of those results with to, and, and the different scenarios that we're looking at, you get very different um, uh, kind of re reactions to it, right? So, some people uh, very worried about the uh, realign scenario, um, and others very worried about the laissez-faire and hold-the-line hold scenario. So I, I think the, the philosophy that we took was to not worry so much about the realism, but to look at a range, to, to kind of, I've mentioned the word orth orthogonal, but maybe not quite orthogonal, but a, a wide variety of different um, scenario frameworks and, and seeing what the differences would be, rather than getting too caught up in the details of any particular one. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot uh, your name, but the 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 mathematical model of uh, um, hardened uh, armor on the uh, beaches. Uh, the thing that sorry, the the my question was. Uh, um, it seems to me that the a very interesting result of having higher loss, uh, uh, higher mortality risk from having a sub uh, uh, insufficient uh, um, um, barrier. Um, that was very interesting, but also made me think that if you have, for example, 50% larger, 50% higher barrier, there's a threshold of risk when the risk profile shifts for ha for that having the same effect. Um, so the policy implications of that result is very complicated. Can you think? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, in the, in the first in the first paper, we we created a model based on Sandy, and we found actually that having a berm that's undersized made Sandy more dangerous. Um, with these models um, that come from other people's studies, we found everything improved, everything reduced mortality relative to control. So that's two different results in so far in two different chapters of our thesis. <laughs> Sorry, Fenlin. Uh, but so there, there's that challenge, you know, the different models are giving some different things uh, and her model's an outlier, um, but it was based on one storm and one, and one location. Um, and, you know, but so then as you have more sea level rise, uh, yeah, so an undersized barrier can be create, the reason why the undersized barrier would create more mortality is if it's a velocity based model and you have an overtopping that leads to a much higher velocity than a gradual creeping in if we're only looking at still water and not wave effect, so in some kind of an estuary or bay. Um, so that's where that comes from. Um, was there another part to the question beyond that? Sorry, so the, 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 the issue that I'm, I'm struggling with is um, uh, we've a priori defined this as undersized according to some uh, level of risk, yep. but then we, on, from a policy perspective, we say that, okay, well, that is uh, insufficient. We want that twice the size, but that twice the size becomes insufficient further down the line for the same reason. <laughs> yeah, so eventually it can become undersized. It may be a century or, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I mean, it always strikes me that I, I think um, the cost of, of raising barriers, well, so it goes up, it doesn't go up linearly necessarily because you need a wider footprint mm -hmm. to have a higher barrier. And also in the future, we'll be protecting the entire nation's coastline instead of just low-lying areas. So so I do all, often question, what, I mean, already we don't maintain our our vertical protections well enough as happened with Katrina, especially in areas where there's land subsidence and, and other problems that can compromise them. 
and we didn't look at failure, we just looked at overtopping. So, so there's more, there's a lot of, you know, this is just one exploration of, of the dangers of, um, of vertical protections and showing, you know, pretty cleanly that retreat is a better alternative for mortality risk in the long run, so. Uh, Temi Tope, you were saying that some areas have seawalls and some don't. Do you, have you seen that that's exacerbating the effect on the areas that don't? Um, uh, basically, the areas that have seawall is where the, I mean, mostly Georgetown, where, there, where a lot of people, where the population is concentrated. And, um, you know, I, it's a pity that I do not have pass, uh, um, opportunity to show you more pictures. The first seawall that was constructed, that was in the um, in the late 19th centuries, because the the erosion started started working on the seawall. After the, the constructed the hard uh, seawall, currently now what the government did about five years, about ten years ago, was to still have a kind of rock armory. Uh, to back up the seawall. Now, uh, the seawall is not constructed all through the 430 kilometer coastline, no. It's only the most uh, populated areas in the Georgetown and um, in some sections in quarantine, right? But in those places, the government could not, uh, we could not make any effort to introduce um, mangroves. But in some other sections where the Population is not too concentrated, and there, there are extremely few seawall constructed. So that is where uh, government could try to introduce. Uh, is it soft engineering now? Mangrove replanting, right? I'm not sure. Did I address that question? No. Yeah. But the, the seawall is not for all the entire um, country. Uh, the, the, the entire coastline. Just some sections where there are some resources maybe population or government uh, buildings or anything to be protected. That's where those seawalls were co uh, introduced or constructed. Okay, sorry. Can I ask? Is it possible, possible for me to ask me a question? Yeah. Is it possible for me to ask him a question? Yeah, absolutely. Please, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, in the model that you just presented, I'm just curious because you was making reference to a lot of places across the globe, yep. to me it's a model. Did you go to those places to test um, so whether the... No, we didn't. What uh, we wanted to do was an attribution effort. Okay. So um, in, when you look at a tide gauge, it's, it's an incredibly complex attribution problem, right? And a lot of the times the ocean is really the issue where we have a hard time because this adjoint problem hasn't been done for these oceans. So it's very hard to kind of, you have this black box of ocean attribution, viscous deformation of the land, and then there's subsidence locally. If you know the policy making locally, maybe you know what's going to be the future attribution with respect to subsidence and erosion and all the work that you've done. Uh, we just wanted to target this box, the ice box. And so we can probably um, be fairly confident in our projections or even the current observations of ice change from all the monitoring systems and probably tell you fairly well how much of this tide gauge is being uh, driven by the ice processes but we don't we don't want to go to the other boxes which are much more complicated where that's where all the uncertainty comes in a much bigger way and so uh, however some tide gauges you'll notice that the ice is actually the majority of the signal and that's where we could probably go and, and verify our observations. Um, there's two components here. The fingerprint gradient is really not an, observ an observational problem. You compute it once, it's, it's done, it's a done deal. Um, and it's been validated by different teams. The projection of the ice mass change, that's the problem. And, but you can use these gradient fingerprints combined with observed mass change at present day. And so that's, that's really not a model. That's an observational constraint, and it gives you the exact size of the ice box locally where you are. So that would be the safest way of using this. Now, if you push 100 years into the future, yep, all bets are off. We don't know if the ice projection is worth or, I mean, we have some idea. And that's where the risk comes in. 
But at present day, I think you can use this tool fairly safely. Okay. Thank you. With respect to um, your model, you, um, you focus on sea level rise. Have you done anything to look at sea level rise with respect to in addition to a storm, as, as, as is very often the case in the Caribbean, where you have um, sometimes storms at a tremendous low pressure? That, that imposes a lot of, of um, even you know oscillates that problem and and if you if you did what what were the implications yeah one thing I didn't explain was we have um, well I mean we're ignoring the details of the storms but the different return periods mm -hmm. uh, are relate to tides or you know the monthly flood is storm or tide but those different return periods are different storms so the Hundred year or th thousand year or ten thousand year are storms l worse and worse storms and storm tide effects. So, so that's in there. And but the water level is just basically like a tide. I mean, it's a simplistic way of representing a storm surge. So we could get deeper into how different storm surges look. But we basically, you know, I guess you could say this is more. Um, we gave it a twelve hour um, period, you know, for this sinusoidal water level fluctuation. So it's it. It matches what happens in an area that has a, where tides are an important part of, of the you know the storm tide. It's not just a storm surge, but it's um, and it has a 12-hour period. But you can have places like the Gulf of Mexico where the tides are much smaller and the storm surge could have a shorter duration or longer duration. So that that could be taken into play. You could have you know worry more about the duration of storm surge and, and think about that. But we haven't done that yet, and that would lead to you know a, a longer duration storm surge would have a slower water velocity, and a faster storm surge. Uh, maybe from a strong hurricane could have higher velocities. So it's a good idea that we could look into that. Sure. You could also probably imagine cases, maybe not this scenario in Staten Island, though, but types of storms, you know, sort of flooding from the back end or storms with really heavy rain where the burn could introduce alternate dangers separate from this overtopping of surge from the front. Mm -hmm. Yep. This is Peter. Uh, this might be a little in the weeds, but uh, it seemed peculiar to me that the um, number of buildings through time often reached a steady state. Is that like a model shortcoming, or is there some physical context I, I'm not understanding? I feel like as sea level would keep rising, the number of buildings would go down, 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 down. <clears throat> well, yeah, I think part of it is the uh, the rows of uh, of infrastructure. So basically, a lo infrastructure development along streets. And so in some of those um, scenarios, I think we were um, eroding through. So it's, it's the number per year that are getting impacted. So that was, that was a flooding. And so at some point, you get to a, a part of the coastline that's not as heavily developed. And even in the future, it's not going to be as developed. So I think we're getting to the maximum number of homes that could be impacted by those high water level events. So I think that's what you're seeing there. I saw the same thing, and I just thought it was surprising. The I think it was a retreat scenario where the, the the buyouts went up and then they just they stopped being a large number. Is that that that's that case? Yes. Yeah, so huh. I was surprised. I, I, for that scenario we are there's buyouts for the number of homes that are currently within that uh, that zone, but at some point you've reduced the number that need to be impacted or that, that are being impacted. And so there's and there's no new development within that hazard zone as well. So that's what you're probably seeing. Yeah, this one's also for Peter. So your model does a really good uh, job of representing the different risk reduction, the differences between the different risk reduction. But I'm curious if extrapolating it all the way to 2100 influences stakeholders' risk acceptability from the mindset of, well, we've got plenty of time to address this issue. Did you get any of that stakeholder feedback or sentiment? No, that's, that's a fantastic point, and we, we struggle with that because obviously the uh, – the ability of these models to produce uh, anything with any skill at that uh, that far out is is pretty low. Um, but the the nice thing about doing that is it, it just shows the differences very strongly. You know, looking at I mean, there's some discussion this morning about um, uh, talking about uncertainty with stakeholders, and I think showing um, we, we felt like we we were able to 
um, work with these groups in terms of thinking more and more probabilistically over the course of a project by showing kind of the mean uh, kind of trajectories as well as that range of variability. And if you're looking only out over the course of a couple of decades, it's all kind of smushed together and so you don't see that. So that was part of the reason for that, but, but your, your point is fantastic that we, we have much less skill um, towards the end of the, uh, to the century, so. science communication, working with stakeholders and maybe folks, folks who aren't scientists. Um, when you show this really valid information scientifically, is there a risk that it sort of implies to a viewer that there's a high probability that a single point on an ice sheet might lose its ice in a very independent way from other parts of the ice sheet? Is, is it, Stakeholders not trained in science going to tend to say, oh, that looks plausible that Greenland might lose a lot of ice, Antarctica won't. You know, I, mean, I think you're focusing in on an important component, but is it second order relative to these bigger questions like how much land-based ice are we going to lose overall? How's it going to relate to the thermal expansion? How's it going to relate to the local land subsidence? It's all valid, but it seems to me that without asking that question, what's the actual correlation of ice loss within ice sheets around the world, with, you know, even within the Greenland case, you know, the reason to think, and also what's the total amount of ice sheet loss. You know, is there a need to sort of communicate those issues first order before turning to this, just purely from a communication and stakeholder perspective, not from a validity of the science perspective? I, I'm not sure because um, if you look at the entire ice sheet modeling community, they never correlate Antarctica, Greenland, Patagonia, Alaska. They're all independent studies, and they, they, get, they get contributed linearly into this uh, kind of hodgepodge of fingerprints. Uh, and so, and, and the reality is that there's almost, I mean, I've done a bunch of studies into figuring out whether Greenland and Antarctica were correlated through sea level, etc. There's other studies in the ocean dynamics. I think I would actually push back the opposite. I think we need to increase a little bit the concern about the fact that a lot of these glaciers can really go um, do something very weird very quickly. Like Jakobs haven't just completely stopped. Right. Northeastern ice stream is reactivating completely. So you're like, and you, you have Twitch Glacier going and pig stopped, but that pig might reactivate again. So if you don't have a clear idea of what uh, uncertainty you can ascribe to every one of these big glaciers, and we're not talking tiny glaciers, we're talking massive basins, then, then you really have a lower, uh, I mean, a lower quality handle on the uncertainty itself. So if I'm hearing you right, as we think about sort of tail risk scenarios, yes. even though it's, sort of, it's natural to have an assumption that if a lot of the ice sheets start to go or all the green starts to go, it's going to sort of be a symptom of a rapidly warming world. Mm -hmm. That may be true, but there may be this other issue that we really get out into the tails. There actually could be emergent behavior from a single ice yeah. sheet that's a potential really large source that's interesting. I think I want to, we kind of want to stop this delocalization of the problem. If you're in Northern Europe and Northern America, you really have a very different problem than if you're in the Indian Ocean. It, and, and, and for example, if you're in Durban in South Africa, you have one of the worst possible signals coming from both Antarctica East and West. They hit you equally, even though East is increasing in mass, it actually hits you in Durban too. Because the, the fingerprint actually f fully reverses exactly there. It's terrible for this place. So they'll have the highest sea level of all. And they don't understand why, because they don't see this regradient fingerprint. So they might not understand that ice increasing in East Antarctica is bad to Durban. And if you, if you know that gradient fingerprint, then you can really assess the risk properly. And yet, arguably, even with that bigger amplitude in other places, I would argue there's still a bigger first order question just how much land-based ice are we going to lose? That's probably a bigger source of spread in planning, even though what you just said... Oh, totally spread, right. yes, but yeah. not. Uh, they won't understand even the trend that's hitting them. Why is it hitting me? Uh, Rick? Yes, please. Can I ask a bit more question? Yes, Eric. and then we'll Eric. Yes, yeah. right. Um, now, um, you have you done practical work or physical study um, investigation at Iceland or some of these fantastic areas? These um, places, Greenland, what have you? No, no, me, like on the ground? In right, on the ground. No, no, the communities are very different. Oh, 
Because I want to ask a question. I'm not sure whether anybody has done something along that line. You made a statement uh, that the father away from the highest one is yep. the worst is the nation. Yes. Right. Now, those people that are um, in the highest land area, I mean, yep. would they not be happy for the that they are getting land because of this high merit? And what's the perception, the socioeconomic um, perception yep. of the people living in this particular Area, especially when they are observing high smell and yeah that's that's really not something where I'm I'm really an expert at because uh, it is a reality in northern Europe that you have a huge GIA signal of uplift right combined with this it, it's it's not going to be catastrophic it's gonna be bad but not as bad as a place like Guyana yeah. really which is sitting far and at right. eustatic at eustatic level so it's really gonna be hit the hardest right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to start this session. So thank you all for coming uh, to the Trends in Vul Vulnerability. We have four really important presentations. And um, I'll introduce each speaker before they present. So the first person, and we're going to do, um, after each presentation, we'll do one or two questions. And then uh, if there's time at the end, we can do additional questions after that. So the first presentation is going to be by Jeremy Brooks, who is at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at the Earth Institute here at Columbia University. Hi there. Great to be here. Uh, my name is Jeremy Brooks. Um, I'm the Senior Program Coordinator here at the National, National Center for Disaster Preparedness at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Uh, and I'm here to talk today about rising tide lifts all hazards, vulnerability in the coast of the United States. And I have no fun, complex adventure to report. Yes. Hello? Is that better? Yeah. Cool. All right. So just starting off first about the coast of the United States, um, I know there's different ideas about how we interpret it. And just for the purpose of this presentation, is this still feedback? I can't really tell. I think maybe you're talking about Okay. All right. I'll just yell. Um, yeah, it's a small effort. We're intimate here. Okay. So the coastal shoreline, as we describe it, is uh, 450 counties. And you can see the, the map here on the right is all of them. And so we're including, um, of course, the West Coast, the East Coast, and then also the, uh, the counties that surround the Great Lakes as well. And the coastal watershed, which I won't talk about too much, includes some of these insular counties that are also affected by the patterns as well. And so just to think about it as well is that um, most people live in, the, um, in these coastal areas. Um, so about 10, it's about 10% of the land mass, excluding um, Alaska, and it's about 40% of the population. So, and then in terms of the uh, overall, who actually lives there? So now we know about where it is, now who lives there. And we think about these coastal shoreline counties, we can think about it's a very diverse area. It's a very, they, people tend to be higher, more educated and they tend to be a higher income. So this is uh, from the previous census, from the 2010 census. But we see that, again, it's about 39, 40% 39, of the population. Uh, and that the share of people who are Hispanic or Latino descent in the coastal areas is actually 49% of the whole U.S. So we see kind of disproportionate sense for the actual amount of population there is. And then we'll see the disproportionate amount of people who are, US, or who are U.S. Asian, East Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian, for example. And that's actually 64% of the population of the United States, uh, or of the East U.S. Asian population. And so all things considered, though, the minority population is uh, actually about 35, is actually 35% of the coastal shoreline county population compared to the, re the entire U.S., which is 28%. So what I'm going to talk about today is just more about thinking about risk, and especially for people living in these coastal areas. So a common framework for people in emergency management to think about hazard and vulnerability is risk. So we see this kind of become more and more of an issue in the past couple of years, but as we continue to urbanize, as we continue to develop, as um, we become more diverse, and as people get older and older. So as a, one example to kind of think about this, you see this trend line looking at from uh, 2000 to 2016, we see the population in these, some of these coastal counties, this is the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico coastline counties, continues to go up and up and up 
and there's still and at the same time there's mul there's multiple billion dollar disasters throughout the, t the time which is not really slowing the growth as you can see there's occasionally around between 2005 2006 for Katrina plateaus but it just keeps going up and up and up and we also see of course increasing urbanization as well which as we know can increase vulnerability it can also increase the potential hazard by exacerbating some of these flooding issues uh, so we, as we think about the hazard again think about this framework of hazard and vulnerability equals risk so we see that um, uh, the hazard is increasing that there because there's increasing severity due to climate change urbanization so sort of having uh, more non-permeable surfaces causes more um, disastrous flooding and also increased density on the coast. So actually, right now it's about, in the coastal county, it's about four times more dense than the U.S. as a whole and we're expecting that to kind of increase by about 40 people per square mile by in the next couple of years. So you see here that um, we see trends looking at, in this, on the left there we see that there's um, increasing levels of heavy precipitation. This is, um, at least this graph is referred to as a one in five sort of uh, flooding event or a heavy precipitation event and uh, so we see an increasing frequency of those kinds of events as uh, as we get further and further along in the time period frame there and we also see that when looking at all these different coastal cities that you see just a monumental increase between the um, in the 1950s the average number of flood days then and then also in the 2010s the, the average number of flood days so we see that the, the hazard is continuing to increase and increase and we look at vulnerability so there's a lot of different things that kind of determine vulnerability, and I think that's something we'll be talking about a lot during this session, but of course during this conference as well. But a lot of things determine this in terms of socioeconomic status. It could be people living in poverty. It could be people, it could be household composition in terms of people who are elderly, people who are um, or children. There could be um, language barriers. It could be certain races or otherwise. And then also, even if there's, they have access to a vehicle or otherwise. And so actually about 40% of Americans living in coastal counties fall into this elevated coastal hazard risk category, so being vulnerable in a sense. And uh, one mapping project we currently have is um, has a variety of different data sets and things we're looking at. But one thing I just want to show is just kind of looking at New York City and thinking about vulnerability here. So this is looking at CDC's um, social vulnerability index. You see that the darker the colors is, and I'll show in a second, the more vulnerable this population might be in this census tract. So <coughs> If we, if we kind of compare this to, you can overlay to a lot of these different issues, including income or otherwise, but you see areas like the South Bronx, Northern Manhattan, Central Brooklyn, East Queens, a lot of these different areas have very highly vulnerable populations. And you also see that down in the, like the far Rockaways and also South Brooklyn, these areas are also, and even the tip of um, northern part of Staten Island, there's, there are also very vulnerable populations there as well. And those are areas that are very uniquely vulnerable to flooding in particular. And so I want to take it a, se a step further and talk more about risk in particular. So I know we're kind of preaching the choir here, and everyone here kind of knows this, but just in case, there's two kind of programs I want to talk about at the federal level. So the first is the Individual and Households Program. These are both programs administered by FEMA to kind of think about uh, is assistance in the case of a disaster, uh, particularly flooding in this case. So Individual and Households Program is when the president declares a disaster declaration, and then um, FEMA can give out money to people who are underinsured and have been, it can prove that they're harmed. So it's a difficult process to go through, but it is some sort of support for them. And then there's the National Flood Insurance Program. This was started up in originally 1968. But basically, um, this is insurance administered by the federal government. Private insurers tend to kind of actually run it. And so with, along with this enduring reforms that occurred over the years, uh, we see that... Um, there's also requirements for certain buildings that have to, have to be covered for this, if they're going to get certain federal benefits or if the community is going to stay within the, um, the National Flood Insurance Program. And as it stands right now, there are currently about 5 million policies in the United States. And just the point about the Flood Insurance Program, if you're covered, then you'll get a more substantial payout than if you were just getting the Individual and Households Program. <laughs> so the culmination of this is basically looking at this, this graph here, is one of, or this table, I should say, is looking at kind of the the gap between being uh, underinsured or the potential risk of being underinsured when it comes to flooding. So one thing I looked at was just looking at some data from the National Flood Insurance Program claims and looking at the coastal states, D.C., Puerto Rico, and we see that, and I looked at over a 20-year timeline, also a 10-year timeline, so we see that that doesn't change too much. So if someone got flooded out on average, or someone got flooded out, the average payment is about 25000 or so. 
Uh, and this is throughout all those different states I mentioned. And if you, if you were between 2006 and 2016, when the state is available and you were, didn't have insurance and you were able to qualify for this individual and household program, you get about $4,000. So essentially the, the risk or the gap or the, um, the deficit for, kind of for being underinsured is just about $20,500. Uh, so just to kind of put it in perspective for a household that if they're not able to get insurance, this is essentially money that they're kind of losing out on in terms of the support they need to recover properly. And just to kind of put it um, in a little more localized context, in New York you see the national, the average claim was about 50,000, 55,000, looking at the 10-year 10 10 time frame. And in Texas you see a giant increase, about 25% between the 20-year time frame and the 10-year time frame. So looking at 1996 2016 versus 20, 2006 to 2016. So, so um, now that we have an idea about kind of the more individual aspects, I want to talk more a little, bit, a little more about this, um, just more the national picture here. So, when it comes to the coastal counties, we do see that there's an, um, a pro, a, it's an unsustainable solution right now with the national flood insurance program. So we see that premiums are going up, which has increased by about nine percent between 2012 and 2017. We see that the number, average number of policies in coastal counties has gone down, and that's by going about by ten percent. And at the same time, we've seen the average insured value go down by four percent. So we're just seeing that there's the, the risk pool is becoming more and more fragile. It's becoming more and more of these higher, higher risk buildings and requiring more and more payouts. And I should also say that this data is imperfect right now, but it is a good first step at kind of thinking about this kind of problem. And so as we kind of think about this risk pool overall in coastal counties versus in the entire U.S., so coastal being especially uniquely vulnerable to flooding, we would normally imagine that, especially like, think about like health insurance, for example, the high-risk people, you know, people who might be elder or have special issues, uh, would be taking on more health care or would be using more health care, but someone who is healthy or young or otherwise would be using less of it. So in this, likewise, for the same thing, we need a diverse risk pool. So people who are maybe at low risk of being flooded, but all are kind of helping ensure that this program is sustainable. And what we're seeing is that um, it's, not, um, it's not really sustainable in its current, okay. Uh, it's not really sustainable in its current um, framework right now. So we see about, at least in the coastal counties, about 8% of, um, of households have coverage. Um, we see that nationwide is about closer to 2%. And then we see that in these high-risk areas, so areas that are known for about a 1% or 0.2% chance of flooding every year, or otherwise known as a 100-year flood or 500-year flood, we see that in coastal counties it's about 30% coverage. And we see that nationwide is about 13 or 14%. So we see that these high-risk areas are the ones that are especially being represented in this, in this uh, risk pool. And so we also see that as well that ma many communities, about 2,800, 2,082 communities are actually not participating in the flood insurance program because this is a voluntary program. You don't have to be part of it if your community doesn't meet certain requirements. So there's a lot of like policy issues here to discuss, but right now, at least that we, as we think about it in terms of the social vulnerability, in terms of the hazard and the risk for individuals and communities wide, this current framework is just not sustainable. So there's a couple of policies that we've been discussing throughout the, we'll be discussing today, we'll be discussing tomorrow, but there's other ones to consider as well to kind of ensure that this is something we can continue to do going forward. Be it insurance mandates, think about premium, think how to reevaluate premiums, also including a thought about equity as well for people who are lower income so they actually buy in. Uh, going through other more um, creative pr in, uh, solutions and think about community flood insurance, think about buyouts, which is a contentious topic, but it's something we've been talking about a lot in terms of managed retreat, uh, better outreach, and then also just really incentivizing mitigation because there is a tangible benefit to that, to the taxpayer and to the um, person in question. And so just think about as well for other things we should talk about is just what, pr what programs work for mitigation? Will this o recent overhaul of the Disaster Recovery Reform Act uh, have an impact on flood risk and vulnerability? Going forward, the U.S. becoming more and more diverse. Can we expect social vulnerability to change? So it could get more and more um, serious as we have um, growing income inequality as well. Um, how much more urbanization can we expect? And how will that affect flooding severity? And then finally, what other policies besides the ones I already mentioned would work to address the underlying risk of flooding? And with that, here's some of my sources. Here's our website and my email address. And if you have any questions, I'm here to answer. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Jeremy?
So I have a question. Sure. Um, have you consulted with any of the communities about the policies that you're proposing? I have not. This was literally just created in the past uh, month or so. So, th and this is just like a preliminary analysis. I proposed this a while back, but I think it's something that our center is greatly interested in. We want to kind of focus on a bit more. And we've done work in New Jersey in particular, so it would be interesting to kind of connect with some of them as we're uh, going forward with our current trainings and our current work. Thank so, you. hoping to do some more consulting then. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, so next, uh, the next presentation is going to be by Fu Xinju um, from Georgia State University. So maybe he is not here. So um, the next presentation is going to be by Caitlin Spence. And sorry, I, did, I didn't bring my paper up, so I don't remember what institution you're with. I'm from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, uh, the Greater Boston Region's Regional Planning Agency. Thank you so much. <laughs> this was a whole to-do in my last presentation. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure. Is this working well for a microphone? Okay. Um, so I'm. thanks for all being here. I'm um, here to talk about MAPC's um, ongoing regional plan update, Metro Common in 2050, and one of our major research and outreach projects as part of that regional plan update, um, planning a resilient region and specifically mapping vulnerability um, in the greater Boston region in the form of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And this was led by Saliki Flingai, one of our re research analysts. Um, so to uh, just give an overview of my presentation, I'll talk about our regional plan update, a conceptual framework we use to map vulnerability in our region, the indicators we decided to use, um, some sample results on how we plan to use our project, and uh, lessons learned and next steps, which is always the important part to end on. So um, every 10 years, MAPC uh, creates a regional plan uh, update to help guide our work and our values and goals for the uh, work we'll be doing in the region. After a long community engagement uh, process with many listening sessions, uh, digital co uh, collection tools, and surveys, we developed the following goals for Metro Common 2050, uh, equity of wealth and health, so working to reverse the effects of systemic um, oppression in our region, uh, homes for all, climate change mitigation and resilience, uh, inclusive growth and mobility, and a dynamic and representative government. And I think all of us working in this area will realize how much these all connect to and depend on each other. So as part of our work in um, taking stock of vulnerability and resilience in our region, we uh, started by creating definitions of vulnerability and resilience, or well, rather than creating um, drawing on prior work, and the uh, definition that we settled on um, frames vulnerability as a combination of exposure, sensitivity, and a lack of adaptive capacity. So we really wanted to create a um, map, a data set, and a set of tools that would show us where in the region we have these intersections of high exposure, um, high sensitivity, and low adaptive capacity in different combinations. Our exposure indicators, we decided to break down separately by different hazards. We focused primarily on exposure to extreme heat and extreme flooding. Uh, we drew on the FEMA special flood hazard areas in eastern Massachusetts. We're fortunate enough to have uh, the national um, flood hazard layer um, from FEMA published digitally. This is not the case in some of the more rural parts of the state, unfortunately, um, and probably throughout other areas of the United States as well. However, we did use that to calculate the uh, percentage of residential land use parcels in each census tract that intersect a special flood hazard area. And we expanded that land use definition to include uh, land use codes that aren't technically residential, such as hospitals, um, prisons, and um, dormitories. To calculate heat exposure indices, or well, an index, we calculated similarly the percentage of residential area in each census tract 
that intersects a hot spot, and that's based on a prior analysis that MAPC conducted based on uh, Landsat remote sensing data to um, calculate about the top 10% hottest land surface area in our region, a land surface area where on a hot day would be above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Our sensitivity indicators, we had a lot of um, debate on which indicators to classify under uh, sensitivity versus adaptive capacity. We also broke these down by heat, flood, or whether this, uh, these indicators indicated a sensitivity to heat and flood. Um, and these were highly driven by a review of the literature, but also what data were available. And I think that's one of the big limiting factors that we took away with at the end of phase one of this process. Um, that if we want to do this sort of regional vulnerability assessment, we are limited by what data we can find consistently across the whole region, which ranges from sort of rural areas to more urban areas. Um, so we looked into the built environment, uh, housing built before 1960 that's unlikely to have air conditioning, um, housing built before 1980, before the National Flood Insurance Program, which would have required certain structural uh, resilience measures. Um, public health, so asthma hospitalization rate, um, overcrowding, living in group quarters, um, populations, um, children and older adults, uh, populations with disabilities. So these were our sort of sensitivity factors. Our adaptive capacity indicators also cover sort of a range of different types of adaptive capacity. Uh, we use indicators rather than measures here to um, just reflect that we, we can't actually um, measure these things very definitively. Um, we looked at areas where there's a high proportion of renters, uh, mobile homes, a lack of vehicle ownership which could assist in evacuation and also in just moving to cooler spots and hot spells, um, social uh, adaptive capacity indicators like internet access. Again, there were limits to how we can quantify this based on available data. Um, that's a very important form of adaptive capacity and something that it's very hard to measure. Um, income and employment and poverty rate, um, demographics that are uh, grappling with the effects of systemic oppression, uh, linguistically isolated households, um, populations without health insurance. So we put together a large suite of indicators. Um, I'm not sure how excited people are about tables in this. Oh, oh, okay. People are excited about tables. Um, so to combine all these indicators into uh, sensitivity, a sensitivity index, an adaptive capacity index, and well, the exposure index was pretty simple. Um, we assigned scores for each indicator um, on zero to one based on the rank of uh, the severity of that indicator among all census tracts in our region. Uh, we used min-max standardization to um, adjust those to zero to one scale. And we combined the indices in an arithmetic mean to create a overall vulnerability index that would emphasize where we had high uh, exposure sensitivity and uh, low adaptive capacity. Okay. So to show our results, these maps show our flood exposure index in greater Boston and our heat exposure index in the greater Boston region. When you look at the heat exposure index, I think you'll see kind of as expected the hottest areas in our region are in um, urban centers and regional urban centers. So you can see Framingham, you can see the whole Boston region, and you can see a little hot spot of Gloucester up there. Um, when we look at flood exposure, the picture is a little more complicated. You see this sort of dark um, ring around the coast where there's high um, exposure to coastal flooding. When you look at Boston itself, which is um, that sort of teal, that light teal color in the center of our map, you'll see almost um, no exposure, um, no residential areas in special flood hazard um, zones. What's really interesting about that, I think, is that um, a lot of Boston is infill. And so these are areas that have been wetlands and estuaries and salt marsh in the past. Um, now they're residential developments. And I think the reason that we have so little um, mapped special flood hazard areas there is that we have no rivers and these maps are based around rivers and modeling riverine discharge. So this is another limitation of our exposure analysis. Our adaptive capacity index and sensitivity index are shown here. Blue is um, sort of less, less dangerous. Uh, red is sort of more dangerous. So higher sensitivity, lower adaptive capacity. 
And uh, what's interesting is I think that we see sort of different spatial patterns going on here. When we combine our exposure sensitivity and adaptive capacity indices, we have um, this sort of aggregate flood vulnerability index. Uh, I think our goal for this index is to help us um, as an agency decide what areas we should be looking to work with, um, where we should be prioritizing our technical assistance um, and our community engagement. So at the end of phase one, um, we solicited internal feedback from our team of environmental planners, economic, economic development planners, um, and uh, community engagement specialists. And some of the main takeaway messages from the people who'd actually be working with this were, um, it's great to have this regional map and say, OK, this is a vulnerable area, but the details are really important. And it's be able, important to be able to untangle why different populations might be especially vulnerable to know what to do about it and how to do outreach. Um, also, I think I mentioned that as we were developing this plan with our, uh, this project with our internal advisory team, a lot of sort of limitations that were inherent in what we were doing came up, and that comes down to data sources um, and the ability to quantify things that can be really important to uh, vulnerability. So um, external engagement, ground truthing, and using this uh, product as a starting point for starting conversations, um, hopefully bringing in information from the region, synthesizing that, and then giving it back to be a resource is uh, our ultimate uh, goal for this. And of course, also using this as a resource for not just climate adaptation planning, but for all the suite of work that MAPC does, so housing, transportation, and economic development. So just to give an example of um, what this product is beyond a map with nice hotspots in various parts of the region is that it's also a database and the goal for this database is to create an online interactive tool where we can explore the different indicators that are going into this index and understand how we can target interventions. So uh, just an example that um, we've developed is uh, targeting interventions for flood preparation planning in areas where there's limited English proficiency. So um, we've been able to use our data set to map the upper quartile of population concentration of um, areas with limited English proficiency in the MAPC region. We can then combine that with our exposure and find where populations with limited English proficiency are most exposed to flood hazards. And it's a very different spatial picture that you see here. So our goals um, for this project, uh, phase one is complete at this time, so we've um, conducted a literature, literature review on quantifying vulnerability and resilience. Uh, we've developed a vulnerability assessment method for the greater Boston region and created maps. Um, so in phase two, we want to not just map vulnerability to sort of where we've mapped historic uh, hotspots and historic or, well, riverine flood risk. We also want to incorporate future projections so we can understand how exposure might expand in the future. Uh, we want to ground truth our initial finders, uh, findings with an external advisory committee uh, and create an interactive online tool that will allow pr practitioners and the public to explore the data and use this as a data collection um, effort. And there are many references. So with that, I'll wrap up. <laughs> are there any questions for Caitlin? Yes. Yeah, no, that was another thing that I didn't mention in the talk, but that was uh, 
imposing semi-arbitrary weights, in this case equal weights, on indicators that haven't been, um, you might have a bunch of indicators that are sort of in the same group, and then that group gets a lot of weight because you're weighting them all the same. So it's really important to think about this, and that's why I think we'd like to present this as an interactive By itself, a limited use. Yes. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I had two questions, and these might be addressed in, in later phases. Um, as a practitioner, this type of information is, is very valuable. Um, but one of the challenges we often have with data like this is that it doesn't necessarily go far enough. It's not downscaled to something that's applicable at the parcel level. Um, so if there's any opportunity to think about that in the future, that would definitely be appreciated. And then the other piece is um, wondering how this is going to be integrated with other municipal plans, um, thinking of zoning in particular, and how we can continue to leverage your work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think we would love to be able to take it sort of below the census tract level. The problem is that when you're trying to bring together so many indicators, together some about minority population, the uncertainty balance on the data that we've collected can be quite wide, and that makes it difficult to say definitively at a smaller um, spatial unit uh, what's going on. So I think that's the importance of community engagement and actually doing outreach as opposed to like sitting in your ivory desk or you know, and, um, looking at American Community Survey data or what have you. Um, in terms of actually using this in municipal vulnerability, I think we're still working that out, but um, as I think one of the quotes was about potentially using this data to make sure that public housing is located in um, areas that make sense in terms of exposure, but also, um, yeah, I think bringing in the sensitivity and adaptive capacity to um, be able to say what's actually going on when there's a vulnerable population is uh, very important. So that's one of the tools. And we already use many of these um, data sources in non-aggregate form for our housing production plans, our um, planning adaptation plans, etc. I think with this, we're hoping to have more of a public-facing resource that's not just useful to our planners, but to our region. Thanks, Caitlin. So we're going to have time at the end for questions. And so a lot of people came in, so I'm just wondering if Fu Shinju is here? Nope. So Alex Disturbanen from the Earth Institute is our next presenter. Thanks a lot, Robin. Uh, feeling good company here as a fellow vulnerability mapper. Um, so okay. it looks weird here, but it's fine up there. I take yeah, it. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> it's fine. So uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, this is um, some work that I've been doing over a few years and, and uh, kind of incrementally. But the, the basic question I'm asking is a reason to suppose that disadvantaged groups are more likely to be exposed to disasters. And if you survey recent literature, uh, you would basically come to the conclusion that this is true pretty much throughout the world, that poor people are more likely to be in harm's way than other uh, non-vulnerable groups. Um, but my question in this research was basically, has in fact the literature shown that people uh, who are more disadvantaged, more vulnerable actually live, or a greater um, proportion of them live in harm's way or in areas of high risk? Um, there might be some different theoretical bases for trying to understand this question. Uh, on the one hand, um, you would uh, expect potentially low-lying, flood-prone areas to have lower rents, and therefore they would attract poor, maybe less well-informed populations, and so that might be the confirmation of that hypothesis um, that I was describing earlier. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, in many coastal areas, you might expect that wealthier people are more likely to be exposed because property prices are higher or people are living in those areas near the coastal zone that are more attractive. Um, and then there's also this whole collective action literature that if you're wealthy, 
you're either going to agitate for coastal defenses to protect you, or you'll actually avail yourself more likely, avail yourself of FEMA or other support for rebuilding afterwards, or you'll be more likely to be insured, for instance. Um, so there could be different reasons why this hypothesis that people who are more uh, are poor or more vulnerable are more likely to be exposed uh, could be proven true or false. Um, in terms of literature, there's a bunch of, there's increasing number of studies out here. I'm sorry, today I did not take uh, the time to update this to 2019, but as of about two years ago, what you found was that um, in some cases, like in New Orleans, basically it was kind of uh, both wealthier and poor neighborhoods were essentially equally uh, likely to be flooded. Um, in um, the UK, along riparian areas, uh, there's slight tendency for socially deprived areas to be more at risk of flooding, uh, river overtopping. And in um, uh, this global study of 52 countries that was done for the World Bank, uh, they found that poor urban populations are disproportionately represented in flood zones. They came up with this term poverty exposure bias. I call it differential exposure, but they call it poverty exposure bias. And basically they say that based on this kind of global assessment with global flood models and, and poverty data, that there's a higher proportion of poor people or poor people are more likely to be represented in those areas um, that are flooded. Uh, so the, the tall bar there is across these different countries. The taller the bar, the, the higher the percent people affected by natural hazards, in this case flood. Um, they did it for, for drought as well. Um, we've done a little bit of mapping in uh, West Africa for USAID and basically uh, you know, you're seeing very rapid population growth in this coastal zone and especially in the Niger Delta, large cities. We've heard from a couple people from Lagos over the last or few hours actually. I was privileged to, to hear two presentations and Lagos is a highly uh, exposed area and I think when the authors of these uh, papers that I cited earlier reference this kind of issue, I think they're thinking of situations like this which is in coastal Lagos, uh, coastal areas of Lagos where you have very deprived populations living on stilt housing because they need to be, say, close to their workplaces or uh, they, they have no other place to build. Um, so that's the literature review. Let's see what some of the evidence shows for New York. This is based on work that an intern and I did uh, a few years ago. And uh, we looked at Hurricane Sandy exposure. Uh, so most of you have seen plenty of pictures like this over the last few hours. Um, this is the uh, kind of extent of Hurricane Sandy flooding in New York City. Um, and you can see it was pretty, pretty widespread and pretty damaging. Um, what we did is we used the census and ACS data, just like uh, Caitlin was describing earlier. Um, we had the same comment by our reviewers that ACS data tends to be more uncertain the more you go down uh, to finer levels. Um, but we had a preponderance of, of census data, so we were mainly relying on the census data and, and less so on the ACS. Um, so we had 6,200 block groups. Um, each one of these block groups had about 1,300 people in them. Uh, and of course, New York has a population of about 7.8 million people. Um, so we calculated the social vulnerability index, which is uh, based on principal components analysis instead of an average sort of index, uh, the averaging approach that Caitlin described earlier. So if you are around the mean of the distribution, you would get a score of zero. And if you're at like plus two, you would be have about essentially two standard deviations uh, more vulnerable than the average population. And if you're negative two, you'd be about two standard deviations uh, uh, less vulnerable than the average population. That's how to interpret the SOVI scores. Uh, so I just calculated the SOVI scores. We actually uh, looked at them for the flooded areas and different levels of flood exposure uh, and did a, a difference in means um, assessment. Um, these are some of the variables we used and uh, they're commonly used and I think uh, a lot of them Caitlin described um, earlier. Uh, but these were also ones that we could justify based on uh, potential relevance for flood exposure. Um, so you want to try to choose those variables that are going to be most tightly correlated with the, the risks to populations. 
Um, what we did with the principal components is you got essentially boiled these variables down to five components, one which broadly encapsulates poverty, that's the most important one, had the highest variance exp explained. Then dense urbanization, including you know no car, uh, renters, population density, then it was essentially black and single uh, parent households as the third component, age, uh, and finally Hispanic and Native American. Um, and so what you see is the same map roughly that, uh, was it Daniel? I'm sorry, what was? Darrow. Jeremy, sorry, uh, first presented, and uh, it's the same kind of distribution. Um, obviously, the methods can vary a little bit, but you're going to often, often get the same kind of distribution of poverty or vulnerability on the right-hand side with the South Bronx and Harlem and in central parts of Brooklyn, and then some parts of the Rockaways and in other coastal areas uh, um, highly exposed to flood from Sandy. Um, so my the bottom line was that there was a, um, a slightly higher, um, actually, there was actually slightly lower vulnerability in some of these flooded areas. I did it by percentage of the block that, uh, block group that was flooded. Uh, so we, we had 0 to 13 percent, 13 to 50 percent, and then 50 to 100 percent. But uh, even though these differences in means were statistically significant, there really wasn't any uh, you know, you can see that they all vary around zero, and so there really, there's not like any great um, difference in terms of uh, what we would call uh, differential exposure. Um, we did find that there were a higher proportion of elderly in the near coastal, in the areas that were most flooded. Um, but otherwise, um, if you look at percent uh, population in poverty, percent population with uh, less than 12th grade education, female-headed households, percent black, those percentages are actually much higher in areas that are not flooded or were not affected by Sandy. And essentially, when we ran the same test for the poverty exposure bias, looking at income levels, it's basically the same fraction of poor population as total population was flooded in both, in both groups. Um, so it does not ex does, this does not support the differential exposure hypothesis. Um, so M Mumbai is a much different context. Uh, we had uh, we basically had flood polygons from this major flood in 2005, which occurred um, in and um, you can see well the polygons are very coarse. It was uh, based on a digital elevation model, but uh, it was a from what I understand and having visited Mumbai, it was a very significant flood and it in fact did affect large areas of the city. We used 2001 Indian census data, 90, 99 wards, but here the, each of the wards had a population of 120,000 people. So these were much larger aggregates um, than what we had in New York and so the, the spatial analysis could not be performed at the same level of detail. Uh, we did the same SOVI construction, and we conducted the difference of means. All the means were statistically significant, but again, in many cases, the differences were not all that great. Um, so here we see uh, the variables that we had available to us from this Indian census. As a side note, it's very hard to get a hold of these data. It was a, just, it took a lot of back channels to get it. But we did finally get the data, and uh, because, you know, a lot of countries consider census data, I guess state secrets of some sort. Um, but we got the data and we got the boundary files and we were able to match them and we did this and you can see the areas that are in red have higher vulnerability and the areas in green, like particularly South Mumbai, uh, the old district, etc., cetera, um, had lower vulnerability. Um, and then we had three principal components, one of which represented standard of life and access to information. The second one was in uh, employment and the third was female employment. Um, and basically what we found was, uh, in this case, these were the only results that were statistically significant, and flooded areas had a slightly higher SOVI score than non-flooded areas. So there was some support for this differential exposure, which you know, is consistent with what I said earlier, that many developing countries do find, you do find that the people who are most exposed are uh, less able they're, uh, to afford higher rents and they're, 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 um, they're, they're more vulnerable.
Um, and then we also found that higher fractions of slum populations were found in these flooded areas. So there was some limited evidence and support for this differential exposure bias, but our data sets were much less refined than what we had for New York. I'll close with Houston and the more recent flooding, which was done under a different sort of guise for AGU special session in 2017 in the immediate aftermath of the major uh, Hurricane Harvey that went through Houston. Um, a lot of the reporting at that time was also mentioning how much impervious surface had built up in, in Houston and how that had affected the severity of the flooding that took place in, on top of the fact that that storm just sat there and sat there and kept dumping more water. Uh, so here you have the kind of um, evolution of population growth in Houston. I'm flicking through here. Um, so I'll go back to the beginning in case you missed it. 1975, 90, 2000, 2014. And then you have the flood depth from uh, elevation and flood depth, uh, which were the data that we used. Um, uh, I should have the source up there, but I don't. Um, and then in the middle here, you see the impervious surface layer a level. Um, so, you know, central Houston has much darker, uh, more impervious surface coverage. Um, on the left, you have uh, white population distribution as percentage of the population. So large uh, white populations here, and then farther out in the suburbs. And then you have uh, the household income, which somewhat tracks the white population distribution, you can see. Um, so um, we just did some regression analysis at different levels, so on the census track level, block group level, uh, and then also just for Houston proper. The take home of these long complicated tables is basically uh, percent black uh, and percent Hispanic populations are negatively correlated with flood extent in each tract or block group. Uh, whereas um, percent white is positively correlated. So you actually have more sort of white neighborhoods, maybe slightly more affluent neighborhoods, especially income as well as positively correlated at the track level. Um, you know, more affluent neighborhoods being more or disproportionately affected by floods during the Houston event. Um, then you had, uh, on the other hand, elderly populations, which at least at the block group level, there's a slight positive correlation, so that suggests that elderly populations may have been slightly more exposed. Um, the take home here is that basically the flooding in Houston, and probably also to, to, to a large degree in New York, were essentially equal opportunity disasters. These were things that affected the rich and poor alike. Um, and uh, in both cases, though, the elderly were slightly more exposed to the effects of the flooding. Um, so in terms of overall conclusions and the so what, um, I think it's important to emphasize while this may, to some degree, sort of disprove the hypothesis that the poor and the vulnerable are more exposed or more likely to be in harm's way, um, nevertheless, we know that the impacts upon those communities still are much worse than they are for um, generally for the uh, urban, um, for the affluent, pardon me. So um, there's also a bunch of effects when you're doing any kind of geospatial analysis and there, it's the, uh, you know, the classic, um, um, what do they call it, the modifiable aerial unit problem and all those issues that come up when you're trying to do this kind of thing that can affect your results. So I think it's important to bear that in mind and your conclusions are highly contingent on the kind of data that you have available. Um, that said, so the other aspect is that I think that this provides some modest confirmation and we could do more testing in places like Lagos and other parts of the world that there is a differential exposure bias in many developing countries. Um, and um, I think that this kind of work can be helpful for the kind of things that Caitlin was describing earlier, where you're essentially trying to target uh, activities, policies, programs to address those who are in need and who are being exposed or could be exposed to future uh, climate risks. So with that, I will close and take any questions if there are any. So are there, um, we'll take a couple of questions for Alex, and if Fu is still not here, then we'll open it up for the entire panel. So are there any questions for Alex's excellent presentation? Yes. Can you use your mic? Yeah. 
there's a little red button there. I wonder if you broke out public housing at all, because I remember it was um, NYU did a study, I think, that one third of the units um, damaged in Sandy were in public housing on the 100-year floodplain. And so I was surprised by the, the results you got for New York uh, because of that. Um, and did you break out no, public I was, housing data? I, mm -hmm. So, you know, in some ways you could say this is just an academic you know, typical academic uh, discussion or presentation. I, I thought it was an interesting question to test the hypothesis, but I think you have to go back to the fact that there still are neighborhoods that are heavily affected, even if on average, you know, you've got the wealthy and the poor. And I think one of the things that we're discussing here, and we've heard more and more, is that, you know, the wealthy and the, those that have the advantages do have uh, a kind of choice sets that are much broader than those who are mm -hmm. poorer. So whether or not on average in New York City, uh, you can say that there's really no bias towards people who are, mm -hmm. you know, more vulnerable living in the coastal zone. In those areas where they are, you need to do things to effectively address their needs. So, um. Um, thanks, Alex. I'm just wondering, I was struck, I mean, it didn't surprise me that developing countries that it shows more that it's the poor. I'm just wondering how much of a factor did just data availability play into this? Because I feel like, I feel like in all these sessions, um, the countries that we're working in, I'm, I'm just, even as complex and difficult as everything is, here, I just think, wow, that people, there's so many options people have and da data information you have to make these decisions, which we don't have in a lot of the countries that we're working in in developing. Absolutely. Countries. I mean, that was part of the conclusion I came yeah. to for the Mumbai, New York comparison was that you just were, we, I, I think India actually could do a lot better. I think they, they could provide the data, but they don't. Um, but um, it's um, uh, very challenging in these developing country contexts to get access to the kind of data you need. And now people are turning to big data and social media and other things to try to, you know, uh, create proxies for, for measurements that, that hopefully you would otherwise be able to obtain from census data. But it's a big issue. Do you want to Yeah, bring so if um, the other two panelists want to come up, because there are three chairs, and if people speak loudly, then um, we can ask. Additional questions of the entire panel? Um, yes. Hi. <laughs> There's a question right over here. So. Hi. Uh, my question was more in the, in the Boston context, uh, or for, for your presentation, but certainly it could be expanded in, you know, to Alex. It's really the concept of, uh, of applying all of this. And, and in the Boston context, I was wondering, you know, you present some really clear and useful uh, data on vulnerability and risk. And there's so much now being put into, like, resilience planning. And Boston obviously had its resilience strategy. And I'm wondering if, you know, this was after that, time-wise, it seems, what you did. But, you know, this seems like it would have been really applicable for that. And, you know, was there coordination between these two? And trying to, trying to wonder why there's so much being done that isn't being uh, coordinated or used towards these seemingly similar opportunities to identify vulnerabilities and address them. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. And I don't think I can answer... Um the time question, I joined MAPC in September, so if the Boston Resilience Strategy was happening before that, then I probably wasn't involved. Uh, one of the observations I have had about working for MAPC is that some of our inner core communities do have a lot of technical resources. So Boston, for example, has a lot of technical capacity to do this kind of project within its boundaries. Cambridge, for example, is another one that has all the data, all the studies, all the specialists working on the climate resiliency planning, all the tree planning efforts. Um, I think our agency does a lot of technical work with um, more directly in partnership with our more outlying communities don't, that don't have um, as many resources on the municipal level. And so facilitating, facilitating collaboration is one of those. We do often 
um, sort of coordinate with the city of Boston on um, many projects. And we have the Metro Mayors Coalition, who we work with pretty often. But I think they're often kind of doing their own thing with their resources. We're keeping in touch, um, doing our best to coordinate efforts. But um, most of our direct partnerships happen sort of in the outer communities. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for the panelists? So if I could take the moderator's prerogative. Um, so I just have to say, like, and I, I'm trying to think of how to say this, it's disturbing to me to see race equated automatically with social vulnerability like that in and of itself seems highly problematic. And when you were focusing on limited English proficient people, I was thinking, well, if translations were provided, which is required by the Stafford Act, that would, I would think, eliminate a big part of that component of vulnerability. And that is a government responsibility. So I'm wondering what your reflections on that. Because honestly, it was like percentage of Hispanic, percentage black, social vulnerability, which feels really wrong? Yeah, um, I think that's a very important question. And it's something we reflected on as we were putting this together. Um, I think uh, a lot of our analysis was based on um, literature review, previous analyses. I think um, our reasoning for including those independent of other vulnerability factors were that um, there can be elements of um, sensitivity and adaptive capacity that have been informed by uh, legacies and ongoing uh, racism and systemic oppression that can erode some of the social and economic resources that uh, different demographic groups have um, in adapting and in responding to disasters. I'm not sure that fully addresses your question completely. Um, yeah, and I don't know. Um, yeah. um, but basically, basically what Caitlin said as well is just like there is, there is this systematic inequalities in place already. And so when we think about vulnerability, I do have to kind of consider race, income, education. And sometimes it's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of correlation between those different um, factors. So just trying to figure out how, what, is the most, um, what is the most impactful way of kind of looking at this and how can we best target this to specific communities or specific people. Um, and so that is something we just kind of that kind of goes into it. And I know for at least when I was looking at vulnerability for this, just looking at the social vulnerability index, I mean they had race, ethnicity, and language as kind of all lumped together in one category. And they're not all mutually exclusive, but they are related to each other, of course. So it is something that just kind of goes comes with the territory. And also for a lot of public health studies, of course, just trying to think about it's something you have to commonly adjust for when thinking about. How is um, how will this affect um, how will the exposure affect someone's health outcome? Because this is it's such a, an important part of the influence on health. And then. Yeah, really, not a lot more to add. I think you both summarize it very well. I mean, the, it's not that I'm saying that African Americans or Hispanics are more vulnerable, and I'm just making that a priori assumption that they're just going to be you know much more impacted by an event. But it's the literature is showing often. That these are, you know, that they are disproportionately impacted by certain types of events. I'd have to go back to the specific literature we cited in our study to look at where it was shown, because I think that actually the evidence is higher, for instance, with heat, um, heat waves and extreme heat events, that mortality and in, in, in impacts of that sort are often heavily correlated with historically dis, um, disenfranchised or poorer populations that you know, have uh, in, in African Americans and others who are maybe living in older housing stock. So it may not be that the race explains anything. It's just uh, sort of signifier of these longer term inequalities that have occurred in society. If, if I could add, I'm sorry, I know I'm, I know I'm not a panelist. So why don't we start here and oh. go there, and then there's a third one over there. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to that, because where I live at, Hurricane Katrina came, and seven years later, it was a predominantly African-American community got destroyed. Seven years to the day, another area, predominantly white area got destroyed. And what we found out, that the white had a lot of psychological issues 
were losing everything that they had and not having access to the government. It really blew their mind. And as a result of that, because of what we had went through, we came to the end and even getting the government to look at how you had to change how you look at low income because a lot of those white wasn't even qualified for community development, block grant, those kind of things. In it. But we understand in order to get our community to be whole, we fought for that. So oftentimes I think people lose out in terms of how whites operate under pressure when they lose everything in disaster as opposed to people of color in the resiliency that they have. Thank you. Next question. And then why don't we do the first three questions and you can all respond if that works. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going to do the classic not a question question. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add that Dr. Atia Martin, who um, used to be the CRO in Boston, she created a social um, determinants of vulnerability framework, which is essentially a very thorough literature review of all the indicators and how frequently each indicator of vulnerability appeared in the literature to create kind of the top level what most makes someone vulnerable. And, and I'm sure, Caitlin, you're familiar with that, but in case others are interested. Thank you. And then over there. So, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm hearing a lot about um, indicators that are being identified through the literature, and that's great. Um, but I'm also wondering if anybody is going directly to the communities to ask them what they think makes them vulnerable or what they think makes them adaptive. Um, I was specifically curious um, in the Massachusetts case, but I think it might apply to everybody. Re Dr. Atia Martin, she is someone that we have identified who we want to be on our external advisory committee for taking this project forward. Um, I have an engineering background, so I'm very new to this area, and um, so I, you know, I'm, I've been learning about social uh, determinants of vulnerability, and I'm excited to learn more. I think the other members of the our project have a lot more to offer in that area. And then the other question was on, um, sorry. Yes, so that's that's phase two where we want to use this as a starting point to say this is what sort of our survey of the literature has said. Do you feel like this portrays an accurate, accurate picture of um, the problems in your community? Are we missing anything? And I think that's something we can integrate in our standard planning um, practices as well as potentially through like online tools. I enjoyed your observation, and I think one of the things we have to bear in mind, and it kind of relates to your question, is that nobody really wants to be called vulnerable, right? It's not a, let's say, um, a very empowering um, tag to have, um, and uh, or moniker. So um, I think that you're absolutely right, and this is sort of comes out of literature and climate change and comes out of the disaster resilience community and, and, and stuff that goes back a number of years. And probably we have to start thinking more about mapping resilience or mapping the stuff that matters in terms of what communities can do rather than what sets them at a disadvantage from the starting point. So um, I think these are good, really valid points and appreciate your bringing them up. I did not go to the community I'm one of those people who sits behind an ivory desk, mostly. But uh, I would love the opportunity to do more of that. So I will say that, um, not only really to this work, but there is a study that we wrapped up kind of recently. We were studying how families were affected by the BP oil spill. And so we had three waves of the study, first in 2014, then 2016, and 2018. And around 2016 is when we did some focus groups. And we actually asked them, like, qualitatively, what do you like what, what is going on in your community, like how do you feel, like what do you feel like really impacted your exposure and your recovery. And one thing we realized later was sort of about the treatment of the health effects. We had no, there was no thing we were aware of about that, but people were kind of talking about, and like once they open up about it, they were like letting loose. They're like, listen, I'm, I'm like spending a ton of money on these like, these, um, uh, like asthma, asthma medication, I'm spending a ton of money on like on these creams and whatever else. And we're like, wow, that's really interesting and good to know. So in our third wave of the study, we actually captured that. And also even asked, how much have you spent on that? So at least for some aspects, uh, we do want to try to make sure we're doing that. And that approach, that study was kind of novel, or at least for us, was novel because we had a more quantitative approach, we had a qualitative approach, and then also even analyzed social media throughout after the BP spill. But for this work, I mean, this was kind of a, 
how would you phrase it? Academic, ac academic thought experiment or exercise, like something like that. Um, but kind of like that, just kind of like f seeing some of this data and just kind of seeing what are some of these, these national trends. And then hopefully we can kind of expand it a bit further and look at more of the, just really kind of understanding more, more of what's going on, on the ground. So we have time for like one more round of three questions, if there are any more questions for the panelists. Okay, thank you very, very much. Thank you.